Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 Most Important Things to Consider When Hiring a Realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, we got a really cool guest today, somebody that everybody knows, and uh, is just a tremendous guitar player. Uh, he scored films. He's made films. Very talented guy with the one and only Stevie Salas. And before we get started, mm-hmm. I just want to say thank you to Yogi Lonich for the uh, connection between me and Steve. Oh, Yogi. Yeah, you so cool. this up. So let me read uh, Steve's some of uh, what he's done, and then we'll get into it. He's a guitar player, writer, producer, and composer. Stevie Salas has recorded on over seventy different albums with artists as diverse as George Clinton, Justin Timberlake, Buddy Miles, T.I., Mick Jagger, and Rod Stewart. He's sold over two million solo albums around the world, and he's been cited on typically on one of the top fifty guitarists of all time lists. Dreaming of a career in music, he left the small town of Oceanside, California in 1985. Eight months later, he was discovered by funk music legend George Clinton as the lead guitarist for Clinton's albums. You're making me hungry drinking that strawberry smoothie. You know that. No, I'm, uh, just, I'm, I'm just waking up right now. I got to get on it. <laughs> Stevie received his first major label producer credit with Was, Not Was, of course, when he pro- co-produced the UK hit Out Come the Freaks from the album What Up, Dog. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine listed What Up Dog as one of the top 100 records of the decade. In 88, Stevie was asked to join Rod Stewart on a world tour as lead guitarist, and this led to him signing the largest record deal Island Records had ever paid for a new artist. His first record, Color Code, is a cult classic in the UK and Europe. His second solo record, Back from the Living, ousted the Rolling Stones and Aerosmiths for best album in Japan. He's credited with providing the score for several films, including Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and the 2009 film Darfur. Over 50 of his compositions have been released on major labels. A Native American, Stevie's been involved in prominent projects that support excuse me, indigenous communities, including serving as the advisor of contemporary music at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. For his efforts in support of Native American culture, He received the Native American Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009, and in 2017, his film Rumble, The Indians Who Rocked the World, rocked the Sundance Film Festival, receiving a a prestigious special jury award for World Cinema Documentary. If you haven't seen that movie, I would encourage you to check it out. It's on Netflix or Amazon. I think it's on Amazon. Amazon Uh, Prime. Amazon Prime, really cool movie, very interesting. It's got a lot of interesting artists in there as well. Uh, The film provides the impact of indigenous musicians in Canada and the United States on the development of rock music overall. Artists profiled in the movie include Charlie Patton, Mildred Bailey, Link Ray, Jesse Ed Davis, Stevie Salas, of course, Buffy St. Marie. Man, when I saw her, it was really a trip because I remember seeing her albums in the library when I was a kid before I could afford records. Robbie Robertson, Randy Castillo, Jimi Hendrix, and others. The title of the film is in reference to the instrumental song Rumble by the American group Link Ray and his Raymond. In 2014, Stevie wrote When We Were Boys, which is a memoir about his first tour with Rod Stewart. The book was met with outstanding reviews and was number one for eight weeks on Amazon's book chart. 
Stevie's released 11 solo records, three live LPs, and two EPs, an album with Bootsy Collins and Buddy Miles, two albums with Bernard Fowler, and in 2017, he released an LP with Japan's Koshi Inaba called Chubby, Chubby Groove, which went to number two on the Japanese album charts, supported by a sold-out Chubby Groove tour throughout Japan. Dude, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Stevie, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to be, good to be here. Hey, man, so uh, what prompted you to leave Oceanside, and, and what were you doing there musically right before you left? Well, I, I'm in Oceanside right now, actually. I'm down here on vacation, and um, I was born here. I, um, I, I had a really cool band called This Kids that a lot of people seem to know about now, and we were really popular. We, and I was still in high school when, when I joined the band. And I, I felt after a few years of touring around the country, playing college parties and colleges and things like that, made, we made a couple EPs. I thought, well, I think this is about as far as I'm going to go with this band. And um, so I decided to move to L.A. and give it a shot. And I uh, moved to L.A. And, and I was young enough that it didn't matter that I went completely broke. But it was actually a good thing because you know, I weighed 153 pounds when I moved to L.A., you know, and uh, surfing and making a lot of money on my band, this kids and having fun, driving a Porsche and everything was great. I moved up there and I, within six months, eight months, I was homeless and I got, but I dropped weight down to 133. So I looked way more like a cool rock and roller when I was super skinny <laughs> and, uh, and unhealthy. Right. Um, and that led to my, you know, that led to my whole career starting because George Clinton discovered me when I was homeless, actually. How did he, dis how does that, how did that happen? Well, so I was living in this house in LA with Winston Watson, who was my drummer, color code, and went on to play with Bob Dylan after me. Uh, and uh, um, we got kicked out of this house we were living in. And I lived in the closet, actually, a walk-in closet with a mattress, because I really didn't care. I just needed to be in the scene. And every night we'd go out and see bands. And, you know, it was awesome. And when you're young, you can do that. Yeah. So um, I, we got kicked out of the house. And I had met, I was friends with a guy called David O from the band The Plimsolls. Yeah, I remember. He really liked me. And, and he worked at a studio called Babyo and a guy called Rick Parada, who went on to, to invent matchless amps, actually. He was a co-owner. And Rick really liked me. Rick told me you could sleep on the couch here if you help around the rehearsal studio and clean up. And so I had all my clothes in garbage bags. And I, and I used to go to this rehearsal studio in Hollywood. And I'd have to open it. And clean. It was horrible. It was my first summer away from home. You know, and I was used to surfing every day in August and fishing and being on the water. And I was sitting in Hollywood in the heat and smog. But um, it was a really tough time. But on that couch, I met everybody. I mean, Kiss came in there and Keel. I made, I made friends with uh, the band Keel. And, uh, and they were really nice to me. But I'd go up to like uh, Kiss. I remember going up to Gene Simmons and, and I'd go up to everybody. I'd say, hey, I'm Stevie Solis. I, I play guitar. If you ever need a guitar player, you know, I tried it. I had no shame. I didn't care. And then yeah. Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons was like, fuck off. You know, really? like, <laughs> oh yeah. You know, like it was funny though. It's like, ah, fuck off kid. And, but I ran up to George Clinton one time and I did it and he goes, really? And he looked at me and thought I looked kind of cool. And he goes, okay. And that was that. So I was asleep up in the studio B couch and he was in studio A and, um, Gary, uh, not Gary Scheider, uh, David Spradley, who he did Atomic Gog with, came in the studio at three in the morning and woke me up and said, hey, uh, I'm sorry to wake you, but you want to try some guitar on this track? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I jumped up and the band Keel was in there, or it might have been Vinnie Vin Vincent's Invasion. I don't know. They had all these Marshalls set up with yellow tape around them. And it said, do not touch. And I had a Marshall head and George Clinton said, fuck it. And we just plugged into all the cabinets and all their shit. <laughs> turned it up and and um there was a guy called jack sherman that was on the session at the time he was in the red hot chili peppers and and the thing was jack was what i thought was playing some amazing stuff uh but what jack was doing was jack was giving jack was a huge funkadelic fan and he was playing what someone in funkadelic would play right right like this is like and he was doing it really good i mean he really had it down and, uh, but George was like, I'd already done that. And I could tell in my brain, I just knew right then. It's like, do not do what I think Funkadelic sounds like. And I just went bananas. And at the, at the time it was 1985 and, you know, I was a Steve Stevens clone and I had a wang bar 
and, I, and George Clinton hadn't heard all those dive bombs really yet, you know, and all that kind of shit. And I went bananas. And George just started, I remember George wasn't in the room when I was warming up and he came running into the room and he, and he gets next to me, he goes, roll tape. And back then, you know, a song like The Fries Go With That Shake or whatever these songs were, they were all like, back then you didn't have digital. So you'd cut the song and it would be 10 and 15, 12 minutes long. And then later you would edit the tape and make this song, you know, because was, there was no digital back then. So I would have to play. 10 minutes and George is next to me and he's dancing his dreadlocks are hitting me in the face and his braids and he's sweating and he stinks and I'm like playing and he goes play some blues and I start playing some blues okay play some funk but I was playing funk with Marshalls and um, that was sort of my thing I loved I loved R&B music but I loved rock you know and so I decided to try to play funk with 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 Marshalls and not with a clean sound. Everybody in 85 was using a direct sound, a clean thing, you know, it was going on. And I was like, I'm gonna try to do this a different way. And, and it worked. And George loved me. Uh, Jack Sherman, unfortunately, went home and I stayed. And I stayed and worked with him for the next month. He introduced me to Bootsy Collins. He used to take me to these films. Uh, we had a song in the Iron Eagle soundtrack and he brought me and I rode in a limo with him. And then everyone in town, thought I was some hot session guitar player uh, in town with George Clinton, because now I'm hanging out with him and Bootsy Collins and Gary Scheider. And they're taking me around like I'm a little mascot, right? Right, right. Everyone just thought I was this hot new protege, right? Which was complete bullshit. I'd only did the, the, my first paycheck I got in Hollywood was that 220 bucks for the George Clinton session, the first one on Capitol. Um, but being a, um, the asshole that I am, Bernadette Peters from <laughs> Climax came up to me in the studio. She goes, "Hey, uh, I'm doing this thing, and you want to come and play on it?" And I'm like, "I'd love to." I'm going, "I'm free. I'm free Wednesday. I have nothing to do every day of my life." I sat in that studio and just watched and learned. I had nowhere to go, no money, uh, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm free on Thursday." And I go, "But I'm double scale." And she's like, "No problem. You know, you're George Clinton." Cause I want to get paid. And no, that's, just, that's, 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 that's balls, man. That's good for you. Well, I didn't, I had nothing. When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Right. I totally and, get it, man. And she said, of course, you know, you're, you're playing with George and Bootsy. You're the fuck, you know, you're a big time guy. She had no idea. So my second session I got paid on was Bernadette Peters, a song called beat my face or something about a girl with makeup, the girl from climax. You know, remember meet me in the ladies room. Yeah. And, and, and then Dick Griffey, was talking to me about wanting me to play with uh, LA, LA and, and uh, Babyface. Cause then they weren't record executives. They were just, they had a band. Uh, I forget what it was called. Cause, and I think Mickey Free was playing with them or it was Shalimar and they got rid of Mickey Free or I don't know, but I didn't want to do that. I was like, nah, uh, that's not Why? what I want to do. Cause I want to be a rock star. I wanted to play, I want to play Madison Square Gardens. Right. And I didn't want to go and, and I just didn't want to do that, you know? I just didn't want to go down that path and be that guy. And um, so ironically, then what happened was Bootsy was getting ready. Bootsy had just signed a new deal with Columbia and Bootsy like Bootsy really took me under his wing. I mean, if you ever interview Bootsy, you can ask him and be Bootsy. I'd love to have him on. Man. Yeah. I'll hook you up. So Bootsy, he like thought of me, he knew I was full of shit. And he told, <laughs> and he told, he told me, he told me, he goes, man, oh, you know, he goes, I was just like you when James Brown found me and I was this kid. And then he goes, I know who you are. And he started to really take me around. He, at this time, I was no longer homeless. I'd met Terry Costa, whose husband had passed away. And he was Don Costa, the producer arranger of, uh, of um, Frank Sinatra and Elvis. And, and, they let, and she let me move into the, her guest house in the Truesdale Estate. So now I'm living in the Truesdale Estates in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Friggin' amazing guest house. And hanging out with Terry and Connie Stevens and all these people. And, and, uh, and, and Nika Costa, who's the most amazing singer. You know, that's, that's their, Terry's daughter. So I used to go pick up Nika from school in Beverly Hills and help out, you know. And you know, Nika went on to become an amazing artist. But... Um, but so this was just this amazing time. All of a sudden, I'm, Holly was working for me, and I, I'm still broke, but, but I have a support system. And I, I then went on to you know, uh, start working with Bootsy. So then Bootsy had a meeting at Columbia Records with a guy that neither of us had ever heard of named Don Was. 
<laughs> and Don was, Don was a big producer in Europe, but I didn't know who he was. I don't know. You know, he didn't have internet back then. Right. right. I didn't know who he was. And it was kind of funny because he kind of looked, he did Don and David didn't look like rock stars. There were these two Jewish guys and Don kind of looked like the guy from the three stooges, Larry with the curly hair, you know, <laughs> cause we used to, Boots used to go, hey, doesn't he look like Larry? <laughs> <laughs> but Don, but Don was this bitching guy, man, and I just didn't understand. I didn't understand what he was doing. But Don listened to these four track demos of mine because they were talking about Don maybe working with Bootsy producing this record with Jamie Cohen over at Columbia. And um, Don heard these four track demos I was making, and he called me and he says, "Hey, you want to come and play on my record?" And he was doing the Was Not Was What Up Dog album. I didn't know who Was Not Was was. No pun intended. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah. Don was super cool. And um, I went down and I played on, I started playing on that album. And, um, and it was like this crazy mix of odd funk and weird art music and spoken word. I don't know, it was just really strange. And, uh, and it's funny because when people look back at my career, they go, man, you did all the tasteful stuff, you know, Bill and Ted and, was not was and the funkadelic i'm telling you right now nobody wanted to play on a was not was record nobody was talking about they were talking about bon jovi and motley Crue, and they were talking you know nobody was talking about was not was except for like really cool guys like paul jackson jr and stuff like right. that but it wasn't like in the, when you go out on the sunset strip ain't nobody was talking about was not was and but for me it was it was an incredible opportunity so then what happened was i i started producing um, and I started doing this thing on the side um, for money. I would go on the TV show Fame, right? Because uh, they they liked my look. And I met Jesse Borrego, who's the actor on Fame. But I kept it a total secret because it was about the most uncool thing you could do. And in in Hollywood back then, you had real what was uncool? What was, like you were acting on there? What was uncool about it? I was the guitar player in Jesse's band, Old Bondi Guys, on this TV show Fame, which I thought was the corniest show in the whole world. So I'm a rock and roll guy, man. I'm a surfer. I'm a punk rocker. I'm, I love, you know, I, I'm listening to Zud Zeppelin and the Ramones at the same time. I'm not watching fame. Right. right? Yeah, but, but you're just earning some money as an actor. Act. Well, I took it as earning money, but I didn't want anyone to know. Because, see, back then, if you took a gig that was the wrong gig, it would have repercussions, you know. Uh, Mick, when Mick Jagger called me, he, didn't, he wouldn't want me if I had played in a bunch of corny bands. He wanted me, he wanted guys that were cool, right? Yeah. And okay. I, so you got to, back then you really had to pick and choose what you did. Uh, you know, you, it was a really, really tough. There's 8 million guitar players trying to get one job. You know, it was, you know, there was none of this politically correct. If you, if you had love handles and you were fat, you weren't getting the gig. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you, if, if you're, if you had thinning hair, for instance, you know what I mean? Mm. Like now, if you can shave your head and you're cool back then, you weren't getting the gig. There yeah. was all these things, right? You know, that were, and then also, and it was even tough for me already because I was a guy of color, right? I didn't look like all the rock stars. I, uh, I was dark skinned surfer with, you know, whatever. So it was even tougher. You know, Matt Sorm once said on a TV show I saw, he goes, back then, he goes, it was really hard for guys like Slash and Stevie. He said, because they didn't fit the stereotype of that thing. So they had to work a little harder. Which, yeah okay which is true did you ever, did you ever feel that like certainly no, not when you were working with stu- george and I and was, those guys no because with them i fit in with them yeah. i was like i was not the the i was not the minority i was the majority I, right. I, with those guys i fit in with was not was i fit in um you know i uh, it was it was like i felt really good and and i never felt that I looked different than anyone else. I never really thought of myself as like, I'm different. I just thought, I really didn't. I just saw right. myself as a guy who played guitar in San Diego who surfed. You know? And um, I remember watching Eddie Martinez when I was in high school a lot with Blondie and with Run DMC. And I thought, right. man, that guy's badass. And I didn't say, oh, that, guy's, that guy's got dark skin. If he can do it, I can do it. I never saw him as a guy of color. I just yeah, yeah. Guy, you know, you were either cool or you weren't cool. Do, do you know Eddie? Eddie? Yeah, no, yeah no. He's one of the coolest guys around, man. I, I, me and him are... He's a great dude, man. You wouldn't be talking to me right now if it wasn't for Eddie. I, want, I know. We talked about I want you to tell that as this unfolds, man. Right. Yeah. Well, well, so that's what happened. I ended up meeting Jesse Borrego. He thought I was cool. We were doing these fame shows. 
And um, he wanted me to produce this demo. He wanted to make a demo. So I produced this demo for him. Okay, and so it, it was, he, he, you, you guys must have talked so he knew what you were doing music-wise. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah man. Yeah. He okay. was hanging out. He, he took me to meet Prince because and, and, he was a big star. Okay. He you know, I took him to hang out with George Clinton, you know, and, and Jesse was a big TV star then, huge. Fame was huge. He was a very famous person. And so he honored me to produce him. And um, right about that same time, now it's 1987, 86, 87, um, I get a call from a guy called Mark Levy, who knew me in San Diego, who was an agent in, now in L.A., he was a big time music guy in San Diego when I was in high school. And now he was an agent in LA. And he turned me on to this thing. Andy Taylor quit Duran Duran and needed a guitar player. So I go to the Luckman building where, where, where Randy Phillips, who was Rod's manager and Andy's manager was. And I meet them. I meet Andy. We go across the street and have a beer. Me and Andy sit down and jam. And Andy loves me. I get the gig. We're going to go on tour. Andy's just left Duran Duran. His albums are blowing up. Uh, uh, his album, you know, that song, Take It Easy, from some movie soundtrack or something. And we're going to go on tour opening for the Psychedelic first. I'm like, this is, this is the greatest dream come true. Two years out of my high school band, and I'm going to, do, I'm going to be playing at the L.A. Forum. And, you know. and, and Andy, I was going crazy. I have, and I never, and I still don't, I have no discipline as a sideman, meaning, you hire me and I, don't you want me to be a rock star? Don't you want me to rip? Don't you want me to play good? And I was like, yeah, I was playing. And Andy didn't like that. And Andy didn't, Andy, I guess was got insecure. Or he was the man and I thought he was the man, but I think he thought I was competing with him and he fired me right before the tour started. And I just bought, I got a budget and I went to the guitar center and Dave Weiderman hooked me up and I bought, we searched the country and I had six, <laughs> six red Marshall stacks with red with 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 300 watt heads red you know back then it was hard wow. yeah and it was really hard to find because we were playing all arenas you know yeah and and uh i bought them and then i show up to rehearsal and andy's like who got these fucking red things i want them black and he spray painted them all black and we're like oh you know i wanted to have color i wanted to have some i wanted to stand out you know so andy fired me and uh mark levy then hooked me up with uh with David Kirshenbaum, who was a big super super producer, and David was doing lots of film work, um, and he he was an older guy, you know, he'd made Super Tramp records, and he did all the Joe Jackson albums and all that, you know. He was a super producer, and he had this studio called Power Tracks in Hollywood, and he said to me, "Do you know anything about hip hop?" Because no one in 1986, 87 really knew a lot about hip hop in the mainstream. Hollywood world, you know, you had to go down and, and find the guys like, uh, you know, uh, that were doing, uh, you know, Dr. Dre and those guys were doing it down in Compton and stuff. But, you know, you weren't really, you know, the LA dream team and stuff like that. But I knew that stuff. because I was listening to that Stevie Wonder had a radio station, kindness, joy and love and happiness or something like the KJLA. And I'd hear that stuff. And I was into Eddie Martinez, who was doing right. run DMC. Right. So my idea of hip hop was big, funky beats with heavy guitar like what eddie was doing to run dmc and what rick rubin was doing in new york and nobody was doing it in la you know not in the, in the world i was in so i said yeah i can do it and so he goes i got a film called big shots and they need some rap and i happened to know a guy called gene page who was a super famous arranger for motown and he thought i was a cool guy because he met me when i was doing george clinton or something and he said i know these two kids these two uh, rappers in, uh, in, uh, they lived in, uh, in West LA. And uh, he goes, we don't know what to do with them because we don't know anything about rap. And I go, well, let me bring him into the studio. And I had him rap this song called Put On The Breaks. And I produced it for the soundtrack. Everyone loved it. It was just a good drum beat. David, David Friendly played this funky drum beat and I played this heavy guitar. And he did a 12 inch of it. And he did all this stuff. And, 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 and uh, Lorimar, which was Atlantic Records, put it out with the soundtrack of the film. And then, because uh, David goes, yeah, that's hip hop. That's awesome. So I would then became a full staff producer for Kirshenbaum. And I would work, I would work at night from seven till seven in the morning in the studio and on whatever he had for me or whatever I was working on. And he would come in and do like Marshall Crenshaw. He brought in Tracy Chapman. I remember she walked in for the first time with a big Afro wearing Birkenstocks. 
and um, she was very shy, you know, and I'd hang out and hang out with Tracy. And, you know, it was just this incredible environment. And um, I needed another hip hop song for this film, Action Jackson, with Vanity and Carl Weathers. So I, I brought in the kids again and we did a song called, what was that song called? Protect and Serve. And that came out on Atlantic and I'm kind of getting hot. And I seem to be the guy that understands this blend of funk and rock. And, and um, so because of David Kirschenbaum, um, all of a sudden now I'm, a, produ now I'm a, a legit producer because he also heard the track uh, that I produced for Jesse Borrego. And Don was heard that track. So Don was then asked me, you want to come produce a track with me? I'm having trouble with the song Outcome the Freaks because they did Outcome the Freaks on every album, a different version. And he didn't yeah. know what to do on, for What Up Dog. And I said, yeah. So he turned me and Amp Fiddler from Parliament Funkadelic, and uh, I got Amp and uh, David Friendly and uh, and uh, maybe Winston A. Watson, my drummer from Color Code, who, like I said, went on to Bob Dylan after me. And we went in the studio, and uh, and we were we were the first ones really doing early sampling because they only had these Insonics that could sample for a couple of seconds, right? And if we had an AMS re, re, AMS uh, delay, I think, or a reverb, one of them had a sampler, and so I was taking cassette tapes. And I learned this from David Friendly because he would do it in his bedroom. It was dope. It sounded like what all the old hip, the hip hop shit was doing. And I couldn't figure out how they were doing it. But I would take a cassette and we'd play it into this AMS. If you had an AMS, a good studio because they were 10 grand. Right? And then you'd hit the button. like There'd be a beat. And it was just like heavy sounding because cassette sounded way better than CD because the tape compressed. And it just was awesome. And so I, I, I sampled all this Funkadelic and George Clinton going through this track. And the amp played us in clavier, all hand played bass. And we didn't lock anything up back then. You know, we didn't have computers. You know, we could have, but we didn't. You know, we could have locked it up to the, the DMX drum machines. But we played things by hand, like real music. Because people were real musicians back then. You didn't have these guys now that just kind of like figure it out and cut and paste. You had none of that. You had to play it. And when, it was real players. And Amp Fiddler played this thing. And. And the Don was loved it. So next thing I know, I'm I'm going off to, to Europe now to play guitar and to stuff with Terrence Trent Darby's manager, because this guy Zio that I worked with was a fair like I, I met him and Thomas Dolby. I mean, there's a lot I'm skipping, but during this little two and a half year period, they fly me to London because nobody in London's playing guitar like me. Cause I'm playing like freak out wang bar stuff, but I'm pop music. I don't know. It was weird. Um, and people were playing like that that I knew, but all these producers. They didn't know they didn't know what the hell was going on and it was just like it was great and uh so then i go to london to mix was not was at sarm studios right and keep in mind i'm still just a kid right i walk in the studio and, and it's ironic i was just doing a festival a year or two ago with, with, and trevor trevor horn was there and i told him this story uh and i walk in the studio at sarm and there's brian may and clogs <laughs> uh there's uh mark uh Mark from Level 42, uh, Mark King playing, standing there with a pool cue, Trevor Horn with a pool cue, and, uh, and Roger Taylor from Queen. And they're all standing around the pool table drinking and talking, shooting pool. And I walk in, and I'm like, ah! You know, but I had to be cool. I'm like, hey, guys, how you doing? But inside, I'm like, wah! Ah! And how old were you I go in, I don't know. I was maybe 22 or something. I don't know at that time. Wow. It was right before I exploded. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you got to keep in mind, the only other band I'd ever been in was my high school band. I'd never been in another band in that, you know? And I still hadn't been in a band because Andy didn't happen. Andy fired me, right? So I, do, I, I go in there, I mix this track. It comes out. Um, this weird thing called Walk the Dinosaur was the first single. It goes to number one. So now I'm living in a house on a futon on the floor in Beverly Wood in L.A., and I'm happy as can be, and I'm flying all over the world, and, but I'm still kind of broke. You know, you make a couple grand here, five grand here, food here. So I'm doing okay, but I'm not like, you know. And um, I'm living on this futon, so I go live on this futon. I go out at night, and there was no internet. I'd be like, guys, I was on Top of the Pops last week in London. They're like, what? Top of the Pops was the biggest show in the world. And, uh, and I'd go back to London. I'd hang out with Bananarama and George Michaels and doing Top of the Pops again. We did it like four or five times. Um, and I go home and sleep on my futon. And I go, you go get it. I'm riding around in a damn li a limousine with, with Brian Ferry last week in Newcastle. And they're like, what? You know, because there's no internet. Nobody knows what I'm doing yeah. over there. But my life is insane in London. Right? It's insane. So then I come home. 
What's Not Was has number one record in England only. It hadn't come out in America. Uh, then Spy in the House of Love comes out. And I'm in all the videos. I put the band together for What's Not Was for that video. which was me and Winston and Carla Azar, who went on to play with Wendy and Lisa, uh, Amp Fiddler uh, on keyboards. And this band looks super cool. And we're all over the place in Europe. Uh, number one record, huge. Uh, I come back to L.A. And Mark Levy, who hooked me up with Andy Taylor and R Randy Phillips, they call me. And they say, you, you want to come audition for Rod Stewart? And I'm like, oh, now that now we're talking, right? Now we're talking. Rod Stewart is a superstar back then. I mean, a superstar. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and I mean, you so know, what year is this? What year is now? This? We're still '87, going into '88 now. Okay. So I'm th so I'm just going on three years in Hollywood, and all this shit is going crazy, right? Okay. So one pause one second. As this was all happening. What was your, like, were you partying? Were you just, like, disciplined? What was, what was you going on? You have to go out. You had to go out every night in Hollywood. Every night, and you had to know what night to be where. Like, every night, I used to see, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name right now. You know, the super famous songwriter chick that wrote, like, Aerosmith's number one song. She writes all the hits. Uh, Diane Warren. Every night, I would go to La Dome at about midnight. And Herbie Hancock would be there. And all the A&R guys would be there drinking. Because back then, everyone used to have drinks at expense accounts. And I'd see Diane Warren always standing in the corner, all shy. And she'd go up and hand cassettes to people, right? She was just becoming this big songwriter, right? And she used to pass out cassettes to A&R guys at her songs. You know, you had to go out every night and you had to know what night to be where. And that's where everyone was. Where to if to you be wanted. seen as somebody. Yes. So if I could roll in with the Jamie Cohen from Columbia Records, I got instant respect from everybody else. It would assume that I was somebody, somebody. we're talking to. But yeah. there's a million guys that look like, you know, all of us musicians all looking around and trying to make conversation and try, you know, the town really worked like that. It was about connections and who you knew and what nights you went where to figure out who could you could meet really was important so we i went out every night I, if you're going to live in la and not go out every night and work the town and you shouldn't live in la yeah uh, because because it, it was all about meeting the right people you know uh connections is my rolodex to this day is, is so important to me of who i can call you know and rumbles and can show you that but it was like that so i was going out every night and i wasn't necessarily drinking and partying every night and all that you know, I was just going out and being, talking to people and being seen and trying to be discovered, right? Hmm. I had dress, you'd dress up like a rock star every night and you'd go out every night and you'd, you'd, you want to be like, I'm somebody. Yeah. Know? And um, the funny thing was, is that it's such a poser town. When I was in San Diego, I told you I bought a Porsche because I had enough money. I was living at my mom and dad's and, I, and my band, this kids was doing well and I bought a Porsche. Well, I lost everything in LA everything i mean i had nothing but i kept that porsche because when i would drive up to a restaurant or a club or something i'd get out of the car and people i look like somebody and i had a car so my, my friends would pull up in some beat up old beater dots and it was a piece of shit they look like oh that guy's got no money right he's, right. he's not he's not successful i wanted to appear to be successful because people were attracted to success perceptions you know? reality man yeah i totally yeah. Yeah. And it was a big deal to me and uh, I would tell my friends, like, don't drive that piece of shit car. I go, I know you don't got any money. Go buy a 1965 Falcon. Back then, it would cost you a grand. And if right. you pull up in a vin vintage Falcon, people just think you're, you're cool. You're yeah. They, they don't know that. It, you know, they think you're collecting cool vintage cars. You know, it, was, it was all ba based on a lot of bullshit. But you had to play that game. And I was good at it. I was good at it. And so, boom, I, 1988, I get a call to audition for Rod Stewart. And at the same... Oh, I forgot to tell you, when I did Andy Taylor, that same week, that same day, I got called to, to play with Thomas Dolby. And I auditioned for Thomas Dolby the same day I, I auditioned with him all day. Then I went to the record plant and auditioned for Andy Taylor that night. And I got both callbacks. But, and I love Thomas. And Thomas, I still love Thomas. Thomas and I became really good friends. Um, I took the Andy gig because he was going on tour playing with the LA Forum. And I wanted to play the sports arenas. And Thomas sure. was going to go do clubs for a year and then come back. But, okay, so back to, now we're back to Rod calling me. And um, I find out that, you know, his album he made was, Andy Taylor produced it. And it was the Power Station. It was my dream band. Right. It was Eddie Martinez. It was Bernard Edwards. 
Tony Thompson from Chic, you know, and, and Bowie. It was all these Bowie guys. Yeah. It was all the Bowie guys and the Power Station Chic guys who were like the hottest guys in the world at the time from the Power Station, Robert Palmer, Riptide, Addicted to Love, yeah. all this stuff, right? It was like, that was my shit because it was funky and it was heavy and it was, I, it was my it dream band. It was my dream band. I saw the Power Station on Saturday Night Live and I was just like, oh, that's my dream band, man. And some like it hot. And so it's that band without Andy. And uh, it's, with, it's with Eddie Martinez and they need a second guitar player. Well, so let me, let me just, let me just back, back you up a little bit. Okay, that same time I was producing a band called the Pandoras, a really cool indie band, uh, yeah, right. all girl band. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're a cult band, really big. And I produced a record for them called Rock Hard. And um, the girl, Rita, that was in the band, worked at EMI America Records, EMI. And Robert Palmer, I believe, was signed to EMI. And one day she calls me and she goes, your hero's in the, in the office right now, Eddie Martinez. And I go, Really? And she goes, yeah, I told him about you. He wants to say hi. I'm like, really? So Eddie gets on the phone with me. And, and they used to call me the Eddie Martinez of LA because I was doing all the rock hip hop stuff and no one else was doing it. I was pretty right. much just ripping off, ripping off Eddie. Right. And um, she, he gets on the phone with me and he's like, hey, man, how you doing? You know how mellow he is. You know him. He's like, man, rap great. All right. And I go, you know, they call me little Eddie Martinez. He's like, oh, man, that's so cool. You know, keep it up. And I go, we, and we both played Hammer guitars. Oh, that's too. funny. I got yeah. It's ironically the next yeah. year we were we were in a we were in a my first guitar player magazine ad for Hamer was with Eddie. It was it? That's Eddie. really so, cool, man. Yeah. So he talks to me, super cool to me, and you know we hang up, and I feel all you know like wow, that was so awesome, a hero. And um, all of a sudden now I'm walking into Rod Stewart. Three months later, there's Eddie playing, and uh, with Tony Thompson, my God, Carmine Rojas on bass, Carmine's yeah, pick, what a team. Carmine, Carmine's poster was on my wall at my mom's house still in my bedroom. <laughs> I used to have a poster of him with Bowie on my wall. You know, I, I idolized Carmine Rojas and Carlos Salomar. And um, I walked Man, in. Is that guy around there. anymore, Carlos Salomar? Yeah, he's around, but he's teaching. He doesn't. Uh, I was just doing some of that David Bowie uh, alumni tour this year. Mm. Was it this year? Yeah, this year I did some and some last year. And with Slick and Carlos wasn't playing because Carlos is teaching. He's such and, a great player, man. Oh, he's the best. I got, I had to learn all his parts, which were so hard, but it was amazing. He's amazing. But so I walk in and there they all are. My heroes, right? Tony Thompson, God, Tony Thompson, power station. And what broke the ice for me was I walked in and I was able to say, Eddie, it's so great. Remember we talked with Rita at EMI and he's like, oh yeah. So instantly I, the room loosened up yeah, and, the boy, yeah. and the guys then it thought of me as not an outsider, but an insider. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because because Eddie, hey Stevie, yeah, hug me. So all of a sudden, hey bro, what's hey, but how you doing? Because yeah. like, you know the New York thing was like I, I talked about this in my book. The New York thing was like real. It was like you'd go into a session in L.A. and the guy would be like, hey, cats, the downbeats at 10 a.m. It's going to be a monster groove, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fucking, you know, I'm a surfer, you know, I'm a surfer, dude. I'm a fucking like a street guy. I like to fight. I'm like a fucking, you know what I mean? <laughs> that shit was corny to me. You go to New York, you go to New York and it would be like, what the fuck are you playing? Play, 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 play. It'd be like, like, dude, what the fuck is that? You know? Yeah. It's like, what is that bullshit? Or like, play your shit right or get the fuck out of here. I yeah, mean, it was yeah. that hardcore. And dude, I like, I'm from, I like, Eddie and I grew up really close together. So I know because I'm, I, don't piss on my back and tell me it's raining. That's the way yeah, it's Yeah, yeah. Yeah, guys would be playing and you'd look at them like, what the fuck is that bullshit? Yeah, yeah. The guys would be like, what did you say? You know, <laughs> so you had to be tough. You had to be tough as shit, man. You had to have thick skin for sure. Yeah. And so instantly the New Yorkers, they, 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 they welcomed me in like one of them because of yeah. Eddie. Yeah. And so then we jammed and it was bitching. But the problem was I couldn't play slide guitar. I never played acoustic guitar ever. <laughs> I never fucking play. I went straight to rock guitar as a kid, except maybe when I was 12 or something, when I used to fiddle around on one. And Eddie, I played like Eddie. Eddie already had that shit covered. Right, right. They, they needed another type of guy. But Rod liked me, and he loved the vibe of the band when we jammed. And he goes, okay, man. So they called me back and said, you got the gig. Uh, and then they thought about it. And by this time, I'm in San Francisco producing the tubes now. 
Um, cause I'm getting hot. I'm getting hot. Yeah, shit's man, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. No, shit's hot for me. I'm getting hot, but I'm not there yet, but I'm getting hot. Are you starting and, to, are you slowly starting to get some, get paid? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, I'm making great. enough money to live on, but I'm certainly not, you know, making like when I joined Rod Stewart, that was yeah. like the whole, you know, I'm making some money. I'm doing all right. I'm playing on Eddie Money's albums. I'm playing on another New York call, dude. People are calling me for, you know, I was the guy you called when you didn't know what you needed. Like, what the fuck do we do on this? I don't know. And the session guys were, wouldn't think, I didn't think like a session guy. I thought like, I don't know what I thought like, but so like, you know, Richie Zito called me. I don't know what to do on this. Can you come up with something? You know, so I'd play like some Hendrix part on it and on Eddie Money and it would be like, wow, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so that, so I'm, I'm getting good. I'm getting hot, but they tell me, they call me back and say, Nah, it's not going to work out. You can't do the gig. You're too much like Eddie. And I was crushed because it was my first big break. And, but I, but I, something in my gut kept saying, I got to do this gig. I don't know what it was. It was like, a, it was like a ordained in my psyche. So I leave a message for Tony Thompson a couple times a week. I call up Malcolm Cullimore, who was Rod's right hand assistant. Hey Malcolm, you know, anything ever wrong? Like anything I can do to help, please. You know, I'm here. Call me. And, and they never would call me back. And like I said, you got to have thick skin. I would be like, yeah. that prick never returned. Like, I just call him again. I call yeah. Him. I'm like, hey, I'm around just checking in. And one day, <laughs> the phone rings. I swear to God, I'm dying just thinking about it. I pick up the phone. There's no caller ID back then. Hello? Stevie, it's Malcolm Cullimore. Do you think you could come down and see us today? Rod would like to see you. Holy <laughs> shit. The tour is leaving in eight days. Okay. The tour is leaving in eight days. Eddie quit. Something didn't work out. They fired Tony Thompson. Wasn't working out. He was playing the heavy stuff. He like Tony was my favorite drummer. But you know when he played Maggie May, it was like, plop, plop, boosh, plop, boosh. it wasn't like it wasn't like Maggie May. It yeah. was like Power Station, right? Right. It was, right. So he it was so heavy and so Tony Thompson's foot would just fucking kick your ass so hard, man. It was like. So Tony left, Carmine Rojas became the MD. They now had the great Jeff Golub on guitar, who is hmm. the god of guitar players. I don't know if you know who Jeff Golub was. I've heard his name, I don't know his playing. Particular. Learn about Jeff Golub because he was one of those guys that was just the most fantastic guitar player musician that uh, all of us knew, but most people don't know. But he was, he just passed away a few years ago and he was like my big brother. He taught me, he taught me so much. Jeff Golub was now playing guitar, he could play slide, and he could play all that shit. And they needed me to be Eddie. Yeah. And I was like, woo. I wonder I why Eddie that, left that. Eddie, I think when Tony left, I think that Eddie, that Robert Palmer really wanted him back. Right. And I That's think Robert Palmer probably agreed to pay him a ton more to come back. I think Robert was, was paying him good, but he wanted big money. You know, he wanted, you know, he wanted Eric Clapton kind of money. He wanted the 10 grand a week kind of shit. And, and I think Rod wasn't going to give that to him. And, uh, and I bet you Robert did. Yeah. And he went, so he went back to Robert Palmer. Which well, he's really pretty critical on all those records. I mean, he did all the tracks, all the guitar was, work on this biggest. It was the place he should have been. It's yeah. Where, it's where he belonged. But I think that he had to leave to be able to get paid. Yeah. Sometimes you got to do it. You got to really be willing to say no. Totally. You know, when, I was Terrence, when I was Terrence Trent Darby's music director for the Duran Duran tour, I, I just kept saying no. I kept saying no. And I kept saying no legitimately because I had a recording contract and I was very busy. But the more I said no, the more the money just became astronomical. Then I said, yes, I yeah. have no choice. You know, I got to be responsible now. But so Eddie left. I think he went back to Robert Palmer because Robert paid him. Uh, and it was, it was crunch time. And I, got, I played. And uh, Carmine worked with me really closely, privately, and said, work on this acoustic stuff. Because I really had no touch with acoustic. Really sucked. And I didn't have to play slide, though, because Jeff was a killer slide player. Mm -hmm. So I went in there, and we played... Uh, we played Infatuation, which was my jam, because that's Jeff Beck, right? And I'm like, like whoa, whoa, I'm like, and, 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 and I found out years later that Steve Stevens being, he was the man of the hour. Rod had gotten rid of Jimmy Cregan and, and Kevin, Kevin uh, Robin Lemusier and those guys, because they were playing old-fashioned style guitar that they played with Rod forever. And Rod wanted to get into what Steve Stevens was doing. And Jeff Golub wouldn't do it. Jeff Golub was really too he played cleaner and more beautiful and he was he said say i refuse to do that you know and i didn't refuse to do that i was a steve stevens clone that's you know, interesting because I, I had cregan on the show cregan um was with him he was like his md for like 
18 years, I think, if Forever. I remember. Forever. Yeah, yeah. He, he went, so he cut that whole band. That's Our band was a brand new band. Oh, right he, after Cregan. Okay. He cut Cregan, cut all of them, Tony Brock, all of them. But then Tony Brock came back when I came in. Okay. Because Tony came in when I came in to take, to, uh, to take Tony Thompson's place. Okay. And, and all of a sudden, we play Infatuation, and it just rocks. And then Rod says in the microphone, he goes, yeah, man, that was amazing. He goes, I want that edge. He goes, I want it. Because I made a, a pinch harmonic. I on that. And he goes, I love that. I, I need that edge. Because he was looking for, to, it was 88, and he wanted to compete with the rockers. He yeah. didn't want to be an old-fashioned. He wanted to rock. He was, you know, and that's what he wanted. I, I provided that. And he goes, you got the gig. And this time, I mean it. And I was like, oh, my God. And so uh, he took me to a pub. We bought some beers in the afternoon, which I never drank in the afternoon. I was like, oh, my God. And, and it was like I had a week to get ready. We moved into a giant rehearsal studio at MGM Studios. And I dropped my shit off. And I said, Mom, I'll see you in a year. And it was like, boom. And the, and the, <laughs> Mom, first, four the first four gigs were football stadiums. Football stadiums. <laughs> My first, a my first four gigs were catalog, Stevie. How many songs did you have to learn? He, I mean, well, oh, I had to learn thirty at the start, and they were not easy. Yeah, and I played some of them wrong, a lot of them wrong, probably. Uh, but I had to write attitude. You know, I remember one time we were playing the Elliott Farms, <laughs> and Jeff Gollum taught me how to play the beginning of "You're in My Heart." You know, the acoustic intro. Blam, blam, yeah. blam, 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 blam. But Jeff taught, me, taught it to me wrong, and I was playing it wrong. I just assumed it was right. And Jeff taught it to me. And Jimmy Creek, <laughs> I remember after the first show at the Forum, we were doing three sold-out nights at the Forum. Cregan wrote on a napkin how to play the chords right. And uh, Rod walks up to me, and he throws a napkin. He goes, I, was to, I spoke to Cregan. He, said, he says, you're bollocksing up the intro of his <laughs> guitar part. Because <laughs> Cregan played it on the album, I think. And then Cregan yeah. taught me the right chords. I'm like, oh, God. You know? So, you know, it was like, I was a stupid kid. I mean, it was, I was just like my first everything, private planes, football stadiums. I almost got fired every week. I was fucking For, up left what, and right. partying too much? No. I started Maggie May at Miami Joe Robbie Stadium, and I was so jacked up. There's 60,000 people. And I played, it like the, I played it like Pete Townsend playing pinball wizard. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of going... I was like, shing, 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 on acoustic, right? And to me, it sounded uh, like it. Yeah, yeah. And, and Carmine and the guys liked it because it had this insane, heavy energy, but it was wrong. Yeah. Rod's like, you got no touch. And then the big thing was, I almost got fired once because at Miami again, they had, it was the first ever concert at Joe Robbie Stadium that just opened, and they had the biggest Diamond Vision screen in the world that was their big call to fame we got the mm -hmm. biggest diamond vision screen when you watch the football game at the end sure. of the stadium it was huge and i started uh first cut is the deepest Pretty and i looked up yeah. i looked up and i saw a 60 foot version of me <laughs> <laughs> okay i just saw this and i was like and i froze and i stared at it and I said, oh, my God. I remember I could see myself right now. I said, oh, my God. And I look over at Carmine and Rod, and they were just looking at me. And I, go, oh. <laughs> and I started again. Bring, bring, bring. Oh, and I pointed. I pointed. I pointed. Oh. saw myself, and I pointed. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? I never, my other band was my high school band. Man. Yeah, this is like yeah. my third or second gig with a band. So I'm like freaking out. Rod yells at me. I can't believe you stop the song and point at all those girls in the crowd, blah, blah, blah. And I go, I didn't point at the girls, I swear. And then I told him what it was. And he looks at me and goes, that's even worse. You know, it's like, so I was fucking up left and right. And it was all I could do to keep from getting fired. I remember we played in Austin and Dave Grissom. And yeah, I, Grissom was on here. He's a great guy, man. Well, him and, this, uh, and another friend of mine who lives in Austin, uh, they, um, they, um, they were in the audience and I got introduced to them. But they were there to... They were there because supposedly I was going to get fired. They didn't know who was going to get fired, but I can tell you it wasn't Jeff Gollum. Oh, and they were looking, wow. and they, one of them was going to, to see who was going to maybe take my take join the band. Interesting. And luckily, luckily, me and Rod really bonded in Dallas, and we had a talk about the band because the band wasn't going so good. You got you no know, Rod had been with Jimmy Cregan and those guys so oh, long. 
And, and, and this was way different. Carmine Rojas was playing through a PA system. I mean, Jeff, Car- I mean, it was a rock band. We had martial amps on stage. Well, those guys were all English too. Yes. They They're were all, all homeboys, you know. Yeah, homeboys. Yeah. And they played everything kind of like, I'm, I'm no disrespect to any of them, but they didn't rock like we rock. We rock like a, like a band from the 80s that were, you know what I mean? Like Bowie yeah. rock. Yeah. Rod's old band was bitching and Rod was a star, but it, it wasn't heavy. And it was a time in the late 80s, you needed to be heavy. Yeah. You had Bon Jovi, you had Motley Crue. You had, you, you wanted, Rod wanted to show those people who was the king. And in order to do that, he had to rock. He couldn't do it lightweight, you know? He it's, had to be big. It's interesting. I had uh, Kenny Aronoff on the show recently, and he was describing the same thing when John Cougar Mellencamp, and it was really competitive. He goes, hey, he had to compete against the Who, Queen, and everybody yeah. wanted to be number one. It's interesting that, that this, the competitiveness, how it really you know, fired everybody up there. Really interesting to hear that. Yeah, when people say it's music, it's art, there's no competition in art. No, there's no good and bad. I'm like, fuck off. I want to eat everyone alive. And you could be my best fucking friend. When I jam with Richie Cox and I get on stage with Richie or me and Phil X play together, yeah. we fucking go at it. And I, want, I don't want you to make me look at this. Sometimes like, you motherfucker, you made an ass out of me up there. You know, it's very competitive. And that doesn't mean it's, we're dicks. Right, right, it's, right. We want to, everyone wants to, I don't give a shit. We're, it's like being an athlete. And, you know, and that's what made me and Rod get along so good is he was a real athlete. I was a real jock too. You know, I, I surfed, I rode motocross, I, I played, uh, you know, football and, you know, baseball in high school. I was, you know, very competitive. And Rod's a real athlete, you know, with soccer. And Rod had the same attitude. We, let's, we're going to win. We're going to beat the shit out of everyone. We're going to kick everyone's ass. And so that's why he needed – the the boys from new york because they brought this heavy attitude man yeah, the edge and i mean when you listen to let's dance man you listen to carmine rojas's bass part man ain't nobody messing with that you know no, what i mean no. it, so it was like that it was big like that and when we played we played infatuation and we played the funk it was like bam, bam, boom, bam. it wasn't like it was heavy <laughs> man it was heavy and the whole arena would be like just rocking, you know, and we'd have the girls screaming and the girls were naked. There was naked girls everywhere. I couldn't understand that. There were naked girls everywhere. It was, it was at like, ride I would tell shows. my friends, oh, at our shows and backstage and in the, in the hotels. And I would tell, I would tell my friends back home in Oceanside, like, okay, I, I don't know why I got in the elevator and all these girls were naked. And they're like, why? And I'm like, I have no idea. I really didn't know why. <laughs> It was just the whole thing was bizarre. So I went from zero to a million miles an hour, private plane, arenas every night, Ritz Carlton's in Four Seasons every night, and and you know from from homeless. Yeah. And, so let me. You know, what was what was some crazy. of the things to the extent you can remember and that is appropriate to share that Rod told you where you said, "Hey, we really connected." What what was that? Again, the parts that you could share that conversation. Rod, Rod so was like a big brother to me i was like his little mascot i used to follow him around everywhere sometimes i'd ride in the limo with him and the band would tease me oh look like a mascot i'm like fuck <laughs> off i don't i don't give a shit man the world is the sun is shining on rod stewart i like the sun you know what yeah. i mean I, I didn't give a shit what i didn't give a shit if i look like an ass kisser or not i love being around rod stewart he inspired me so much and he was a real prick don't get me wrong but so am i you know so i understood it <laughs> you know he um he he Okay, one time in, the, in 87, before I knew Rod, I saw him drive up to the, by the Roxy, and he had this Mercedes-Benz that was the most trickest Mercedes-Benz I'd ever seen in my life. And it was like early on of an AMG car that was customized probably some in England or some Europe and Germany. It was, it was like, I'd never seen nothing like that. It was the body was done with these wheels. I was like, holy shit, that fucking car is, I'd never seen nothing like that. And Rod gets out of it. I'm like, oh, my God, that's my dream car. Well, you know, all of a sudden it's 88. And Rod's like, hey. Um, I told him about the brown murky. I was like, you know, I'm selling it. You want it? I go, yeah, I want to buy it. I want to buy it. So I, yeah, I had the cash. I was 50 grand or something like that. And I went to give him the money for it. And he wouldn't let me buy it. And he says, you know, when I put out my first album, I put out Maggie May. He goes, I put out a single, Reason to Believe. And um, I had a job. I used to work as a grave digger. 
And he goes, and I took the advance I got for that record and I bought myself a little flat, a little tiny apartment. Yeah. I didn't know if I was ever going to go anywhere, if it was going to ever sell. And lucky for me, he goes, someone flipped it over and Maggie Mae was the B side. And it changed my life because, but I had no idea. So he goes, you're not buying my car. He goes, take that money and go buy a house. So I took that money and I went and bought a place in Delmar. That's and, uh, really, really cool of him. So he was really mentoring yeah. you, like, as far as to make some good decisions oh, for you. Oh, yeah. Well, that's great. Here's the fun- this is funny. I, I got signed to Island literally a month after I joined Rod. And I had to keep it a secret because they were already, I was already on, I was already like, Stevie, you know, you shouldn't even be in this band. You're on double so, secret so, probation. Yeah. So the last <laughs> thing I wanted to do was tell them, by the way, I just got this massive recording contract. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, because I really didn't want to go make my record at that point. I was loving being with the boys. The boys were like my big brothers. They were like, that's why they, the book's called When We Were the Boys. They yeah. were like my big brothers. And we were like an army. Everywhere we went, you fucked with them, you fucked with all of us. It was like that. We'd go into places and just mow it down. And Rod was always with us. We would go and take over places. And I didn't want to leave that because it was like, I felt I was so in love with every, all these guys. It was just like, we were having the greatest time, man. It was just like, Brad would go, get the jet. We're going to have a party in Atlanta. And we would just take off on the jet from DC to Atlanta and rent out the whole top of the Ritz Carlton and girls would show up. We just did crazy shit like we were brothers. It was so amazing. And I didn't want them to think I was going to leave because I had a recording card. Sure. So I, so I kept it a secret. And um, one day I'm sitting at a table in Wisconsin with Rod and Randy Phillips, and maybe Arnold Stiefel, the two big managers. And I sit down to grab a sandwich or some shit. So Rod goes, so uh, I heard you signed a really big contract with, with uh, Island Records. Well, it turns out Rod's best friend was, was, uh, was uh, um, oh shit, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. And, I, and he was the head of Island Publishing who signed me to a publishing deal for hundred grand or whatever. And so Rod knew everything. And I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, and he found out it was months ago that I got signed. I never said a word. I'm like, ah, uh, well, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was all sheepish, right? I was all afraid. And uh, Rod started laughing. He just started laughing. And I go, what's so funny? And he goes, because <laughs> all my career, I always had all these guys in my band and all of them were trying to get record contracts. And they all were like, we're going to leave you and we're going to go be our own big star. And they never did. And here you barely can even play acoustic guitar. You're in this band for <laughs> eight, month, eight months now. And you got a huge recording contract. He goes, you of all people. It's like, ah. Because you know, I shouldn't even have been in the band, right? It was, like, it was like, he was just like, I can't believe this. He thought it was just so funny because... You know, Cregan, and I, I love Cregan, don't get me wrong, but all those guys hated me in the beginning. They all hated me. I was this little kid. Sure. I, fuck, I didn't really belong in that band. I didn't earn it. I didn't go do five other gigs before I went to the biggest gig in the yeah, world. Yeah. I went straight to the big, and people resented that, and I don't blame them. Sure. So, so they were all ripping on Which me This is pretty lot. mature of you to, to say that. Yeah, it was true. I, yeah. you know, I'll, call, I'll call a spade a spade. I understood it. Yeah. But I didn't give a shit either. I'm like, fuck you. Well, of I'll course not. Yeah. Ass. At the same time, I'm like, I'll kick your fucking ass. I don't give a shit. You know, it's like I have that it's an attitude of a killer. You know, I'm, a, I'm Apache Indian. I'm going to give a shit. You know, and I go, I respect that. But fuck off. I'm still <laughs> taking this gig. You know, so I, um, I understood what he was saying. And, uh, and I, I really probably, you know, here I was the guy who shouldn't even have been in the band. Everybody was ripping on me. I didn't deserve it. I wasn't good enough. And now I have a huge recording contract to boot. Right. So he was laughing. He thought it was cool. The other thing Rod told me was um, I had a, my first album color code came out and it was critically reviewed globally. I toured the world. I toured, I toured for six months opening for Satriani, which made me kind of a, kind of a thing that made me a famous guitar player because that's when I won the guitar. I got third in the guitar readers poll, guitar world readers poll that year. Uh, best new guitarist and I got number one in the, the, in the Japanese guitar readers ball and I got num- maybe number two in, in England uh, I think Nuno got number one uh, but I beat Nuno in Japan I don't know it was like all yeah. of us guys were you know so it made me a really popular guitar player opening for Satriani and, and then I went out on my own in Europe with the 24-7 spies and different bands and we tour around the world oh Ronnie world tour. and uh, Jimmy and yeah 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 and so oh, that was more my here. world 
more than Satch. Satch was a really hard gig because every band that ever opened for Joe Satriani had gotten booed off the stage. And I lasted the whole tour and I get a standing ovation every night. Joe loved that. Oh, that's and, nice. Um, yeah, he's a yeah. wonderful guy, man. I had him on here. He's a great dude, man. The greatest. And, and the thing is, is that you, you know, it was like uh, every night I had to be at my beyond utmost best, just, just to hold on by my fingers, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it was so stressful. It was so exhausting. And, and, you know, I played a 5,000 people a night and there maybe be five girls. Even I loved playing the girls. It was dudes. Oh yeah. Guitar dudes. All they, would, of them. Yeah. they would just stare at you. I remember some guy yells, what the fuck is that? All he's doing is pentatonics. And I didn't even know what a pentatonic was until Rusty Anderson told me what a pentatonic was. <laughs> so I never took a lesson. I mean, Rusty, Rusty Anderson went, yeah, you really do the pentatonic swan. I'm like, what's a pentatonic? That's so funny. And, you know, yeah, Rusty Anderson's the first guy ever told me what a pentatonic was. So, you know, and so, you know, it was high stress, but in the end, it was good for me as a foundation, as an artist, because I had the George Clinton Foundation as someone credible with Bill Laswell and Bootsy Collins and was not was. And then I also had the rock and roll credibility with Rod Stewart as an arena act. And now I had this guitar player credibility because of Satriani. Yeah. That's... And it gave me, it gave me a great foundation for a career that I, I never, my phone never stopped ringing. I always had an opportunity, which was really good. You know, I set up the foundation. How did you get, what prompted them? Like, how did you get that record deal, man? I mean, cause like even Rod said, all these guys wanted a deal and you come in out of nowhere. How did that? Well, I had a band since the day I moved to LA. I moved to LA to get a record deal. I moved to LA in 85 to get a record deal. I had a band with Winston and uh, we played Madame Wong's. Me and Robert Trujillo's bands and all our bands would play the same night at Madame Wong's, you know, and uh, all of us were coming up. Matter of fact, when I got my first development deal with Elector Records, I asked Robert Trujillo to be my bass player. And he was, he had a band with David Dunn and, and some other guys. And he goes, well, I think we're going to get signed. I want to try to stick it out with my own band. Sure. You know, years later, years later, me and Robert playing his band Mass Mental together. You know, I, we play Lollapalooza and shit like that. Um, but me and Robert have been friends since we were both completely starving musicians, right? Um, but so I always had a band and I was always showcasing. I was always recording my own demos and, and people love my demos. And because um, I was doing this weird hybrid of funk and rock and, and everyone thought it was cool and it was different. It was unique and it stood out. There was no Rage Against the Machine then, you know. Um, Tom had a band called Lockup, and I got signed to Island, and Tom got signed to, to um, Geffen. I think Tom Morello. Yeah, and uh, we were the only guys kind of doing that. We were the only guys doing it, like rock and roll, f funk with a rock sound. And he was getting, you know, and the Chili Peppers, of course. Uh, but the Chili Peppers were more crazy. It was just more crazy before, you know, before Fusante joined, and it kind of settled them down. But you know. So it was kind of a weird hybrid. And, uh, and so, uh, so I had this sound that people really thought was cool. I also had the credits with Rod Stewart. Bill and Ted came out, was making a billion dollars. Um, the um, was not, was that a number one record? I mean, everything I touched you had, was, every, Yeah, you produced was that. Huge. Right. Yeah, yeah. Everything I touched was huge. It was like everything I did was like exploding. And, and so they signed me and they gave me a really good contract. Bill Graham was my manager then. And that's how come I wow. opened up for Satriani because Bill managed Satriani. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah, because he talked about, man, he had a great story, which I'm sure you know about, how he wound up paying for his first record and all that, and Bill, what Bill did for him, yeah. Bill really, was the best. Yeah, Bill was so really cool. cool. Uh, yeah. Wow. When, okay, so let me ask you this, Stevie. When you, as you were going through all this, right, when you were younger, did you ever think about, um, was it the kind of thing where, shit, I'm just going to, like, this is great. Or did you know, when I say no, you know, some people say, I, I knew X, Y, Z was going to happen. I just didn't know how and when. Mm, I'll tell you the honest truth. Yeah. Um, I started playing guitar when I was 15. I started late. But by the time I was 16, I was kind of getting pretty good pretty fast. And good enough to play with a, a, a drummer and another guitar player let me play with them. They were much older than me. And... Um, I, I liked it a lot. I loved it. I was like obsessed with it. I'd practice three hours a day just listening to Aerosmith and Ted Nugent and, and Earth, Wind and Fire. I put all those records on in my bedroom and just try to play them. I know I was playing them all wrong probably. I don't, but it was like I, I could understand the attitude and I loved it. And so I started playing my first backyard parties in 11th grade. And I loved that. I loved it. 
but I also loved the ocean and I surfed and I worked on fishing boats and I, you know, like I could fish and I was a water guy. I loved the ocean. So my plan was to join the Coast Guard. Okay. And so I thought, well, but, but my band, once I got into 12th grade, my band, we changed a few members, this kid's did, and it became all of a sudden we were the hot. I mean, we had girls that were chasing us and screaming and crying like it was Duran Duran. And it was like a phenomenon. It was crazy, weird, man. Everywhere we played, it was like and we were four really good looking guys. And again, I was still the kid. Everybody was older than me. The, uh, the oldest guy might have been 20 and I was 17, you know, okay. that kind of thing. And uh, I was still in high school. My whole band came to my graduation, which was funny. <laughs> but um, it's funny. We would play high school dances and all college gigs. And, 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 and it was just like this crazy thing. Like people just freaked out. And so I told my dad, I go, I'm going to just do this for a little while and see what happens. And, and if it peters out, I'll, I'm going to join the Coast Guard. So that was the plan. So then all of a sudden, you know, a few years goes by, and I decide I, I'm moving to L.A. and get a shot there. And I remember I was really struggling. Like I talked about early on, homeless, and I had the guest house. But even in the guest house, as far as my dad knew, I had nothing. I used to live on $1,000 a month. That was my thing. If I can make $1,000 a month, I can pay all my bills, and I can eat. So I needed to make $12,000 a year. And then with that, I could live a pretty good life in LA and get out every night and try to, I didn't have anything, but I could get out every night and try to make something happen. And my dad called me one day. Now it was now it's 87. And I, he didn't know about all the production stuff and me, you know, I was flying back with the Europe, but he didn't, you know, didn't quite understand it. And he said, he says, son, he goes, I just want to ask, bring this up. And he goes, and he was so gingerly about it. He's like, but don't get me wrong. I'm not thinking saying anything negative i'm not saying it's not going to happen but i just want you to think about what are you are you going to fall back on i'm not saying i'm sure you're going to make it but maybe just in case something happens and you don't do we know what you want to do with your life and i was like yeah dad i'll join the coast guard he's like okay you still want to do that I'm like yeah and a year later i was playing stadiums with rod stewart and um, i remember we were playing a football stadium in san diego my hometown and of course, everybody I knew since I was born there was there. And uh, my mom said, my dad, the concert started and the lights hit, you know, and there's 25,000, 30,000 people there, whatever. And the people are screaming and they're reaching up and they're ripping at my pants and they're going crazy and under underwears are flying on the stage. And my mom said, my dad sat there and he didn't say one word. She said he'd sat there and looked with a dumbfounded look on his face like, 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 I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't, I can't believe this is happening from just three years ago was that. It was a home. I was home living in the, my parents' house three years ago. And, he, she, and she said all the way back to the house in Oceanside, said he, she drove. And he sat there like, just like, like <laughs> no response, nothing. He was just like, the whole thing was overwhelming. He was just dumbfounded by what he had just witnessed. And... You know, and it ended quickly because pretty soon he was inviting all my aunts and uncles to fly up to Sacramento to play the Arco Arena and my dad would come. You know, right. it became fun. It became fun. But in the beginning, it was a big shocker to everybody because I literally, Rod Stewart, people don't realize it now. He was the biggest, one of the biggest acts oh, yeah. in the world. Yet him, Elton John, Tina yeah, Turner, right. David Bowie, you know, it was like those were the super superstars. And so it was just, it was weird. Yeah. But so I did have a backup plan. What kind of work did your dad do? He was just a simple guy. He went to, he would join, he left uh, Wyoming, lived in the country and was 17, went and fought in the Korean War, ended up in Camp Pendleton. He worked in Camp Pendleton. I was born in Oceanside right next to Camp Pendleton. And he worked civil service for the government. For the government. And uh, we lived a simple middle-class life. I think he made 30 grand a year, but back then that was plenty. Sure. We all, we were all happy. It was all good. And, uh, and, uh, you know, it was just a normal life. I, you know, we surfed every day and we hung out. It was just like a great, great, I had an amazing life growing up and other than i had a bad run uh when i was living with my mother but once i went to live with my father man everything got to be amazing how many brothers any brothers and sisters or your only child two sisters two, two sisters. sisters any of them in music yeah. at all or no no interesting yeah wow that's wild um, yeah crazy well how, talk about bill and Ted. man first that's a really this whole story is really cool thank you man i really is okay. nice to hear that whole it's always good to hear like I was homeless and then 
th- I stuck it out and this shit happened. I'm on stage with Rod. You know, that's a great yeah. fucking story, man. And, and it's true. Uh, funny thing is it's true. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Bill and Ted's. How did that come about? And how did that? I mean, okay. So I'm sorry. Remember film? I told you I was, a, I was a staff producer for David Kirschenbaum. Right. Okay. Um, one day David comes in and he says, Stevie, come see me. I need to talk to you. And uh, I go, what's going on? He goes, um, he goes, there's this movie they're making. It's kind of this weird movie. It's a low budget film. Uh, George Carlin's in it. Cause there's no other stars. Keanu Reeves wasn't a star. Then none of those guys were stars. And he goes, uh, they made it. It's about these kids that travel in time and they're, and they're rock and roll. They, they have a dream of being rock and roll guys. And it's a rock and roll kind of a film. And he goes, uh, but there's no rock guitar in the film. <laughs> and I go, oh, somebody scored it. Um, I think Amos, is, Amos Newman, my buddy from William Morris, I think his, his cousin scored it, uh, Randy Newman's son or something. I don't know. And, but it's not a rock score. And he goes, I want you to rescore the film. But I didn't take away the original score. I just played guitar and brought up the whole film and pieces. And I, and I orchestrated guitar throughout the whole film, rock guitar. And then, um, and then the other thing I had to do, there's a couple of things I had to do. I also had to create the Bill and Ted sound, you know, when they were jumping around in a garage, there's okay. nothing there. You know, I had to do that. There was nothing there. And then yeah, also do, 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 that, that thing, all that, but more the stuff in the garage, like, let's play it. And they don't know how to play it. It's okay. awful, right? Okay. All that. Yeah. I mean, I sat there and playing the piano and the part when the girl's going, ding. I was watching her, ding. Yeah, there's <laughs> nothing there. Um, and I'll tell you how I did the Bill and Ted guys. It's kind of important. But I, um, you know, like in the whole scene, Kona Silence, uh, Robbie Rob song comes on. I mean, they had almost all the songs in the soundtrack already on it. Uh, they were ready to put it out, but it wasn't working, right? And, uh, and the other thing uh, that happened was, let me, don't let me forget this, because the very end, the guitar solo scene I played, mm-hmm. that wasn't in the film. That was not in the film. They had me score this film, okay? So, so for instance, they really wanted you to, not Robbie Robs in time, but they couldn't get YouTube. You two. Right. So they had Robbie Rob who did this great song called In Time. But they wanted you to you two. So I added, if you watch the film, the edge. Oh, I did like all the edge. edge. I did all the edge shit over Robbie's song throughout that whole scene. Okay. And, and, and then everyone used to write me going, where's that version of the song? Because Robbie's version doesn't have any of that in it. Okay. So I was doing this crazy score over the score of the whole film. All that shit, okay? Uh, and then, so to do Bill and Ted, to do Alex and Keanu, uh, I was, I would try to play shitty. But when I tried to play shitty, in my heart, it felt like I was being pompous. It felt like I was going, oh, <laughs> it's like, man, man, like trying to be, and it felt fake to me. And, and I don't know why, but I felt like I was disrespecting Bill and Ted by doing that okay so no matter how bad i tried to play like a guy who didn't know how to play because they didn't know how to play right they just like beginners in their bedroom right but they'd stand up and start standing there and goof it it sounded fake it sounded pretentious to me it sounded like i was thinking i was better than them i know this is crazy because nobody would give a fuck but to me it did so then i came back in another day and i said let me try this again and i took my my guitar and i flipped it upside down okay and i played it left-handed and that's how i do all the bill and ted scenes i Uh-oh. play left-handed because i don't know how to play left-handed right the bar, and a bling, 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 you know it i played it left-handed and it's it was perfect it was so real it was so real to me at least i don't know if anybody else ever could notice but to me it was so believable they're like wow and they're jumping around in the room and I just played it all left-handed. And it felt more authentic to you that way. It, it felt and more respectful, real. I guess. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it just felt real. You know, every time I did it the other way, I sounded like some guy thinking I'm better than them and playing or trying to be shitty or oh, play shitty. I literally could play shitty left-handed and it was real. Right, it okay. Wasn't, it wasn't fake. It's funny how and, things, how you figure out solutions for things sometimes. Well, I wanted it to be real. If I'm going to score a film, I want it to be real believable, right? Yeah. I don't. It's not about my ego. It's about. And for me, I felt so proud to play it left-handed because it sounded <laughs> so fucking shitty that it was awesome, you know? It was so awesome. And uh, and then what happened was the film was done, 
Uh, we all went on our own separate ways working on other shit. And then Kirschenbaum calls me in again. He goes, Stevie, we got, we got to um, do this thing. Are you free this week, um, Tuesday night or whatever? I'm like, yeah, whatever. He goes, like, what is it? He goes, well, they, they've been testing Bill and Ted. And it's getting good testing things, but people don't like the ending. So they're going to reshoot a new ending. I go, well, what is it? So by this time, I, I, Stephen Herrick, the director, was my friend because he used to come and sit on the – it was such a low-budget movie that Stephen Herrick, who, you know, and they did 101 Dalmatians and Mr. Holland's Opus and Rockstar. I mean, he's a huge director. But at the time, he used to show up at my house where I lived on that futon I told you about on the floor. And I'd sit on the futon. And we'd put in VHS tapes of edits, and he'd have Led Zeppelin in the soundtrack. We couldn't afford Led Zeppelin. So I'd, <laughs> I'd write a piece of music that had the same tempo and the same sort of feeling. He'd go, yeah, that. And I'd do it with acoustic guitar right there in the bedroom, you know, bam, 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 basic. And he'd be like, that's it. And I'd go into the studio that night, and I'd record it. That's okay. how I sco- did all those songs. Um, I also had to produce Warrant for the soundtrack. Warrant was an up-and-coming band that hadn't been signed yet. And a and was doing the soundtrack, and a and wanted to sign Warrant. So I had to go produce Warrant uh, for the soundtrack as well. Um, but now when we're shooting the end of the film, um, I go, what are we going to do? And Stephen Herrick goes, I don't know. We're just going to do some kind of crazy guitar thing with George Carlin. And I don't know what, but we'll figure it out. So I go, okay. So I show up at this house in the Pacific Palisades and they took someone's garage and they made it into, they had the telephone booth and had all that. They made it into that place, you know? And, um, what, I go, what are we doing? So me and George Carlin put on matching outfits and I shared a trailer with George Carlin. I hung out with George Carlin all night. He told me the most amazing <laughs> stories. It was the most amazing night of my life. What was he like? And he was just the most uh, straight ahead, awesome bitching guy. Everything he said was like common sense of just awesomeness. Like for instance, when I was a kid, I watched the Academy Awards, I think it was. And they go, ladies and gentlemen, George Carlin. And he walked out and the crowd cheered. And he walked up to the mic like any comedian does. And then he stood there at the mic. And he kind of just kept looking around. And it was dead silence. And he kind of was like, I'm just looking at the people. And he's kind of just standing there. And it was dead silence. And I'm like, what's he doing? We're all like, I remember my parents were like, what the hell is he doing? He's just like, and all of a sudden it was like a minute of dead silence. And then all of a sudden you hear one person go, <laughs> Then you're, <laughs> and then pretty soon, by the second minute, the whole place is screaming and laughing. And he just goes, thank you very much. And he walked off. He didn't say one word. <laughs> so I asked him about that. He told me, oh, God. He goes, he goes, I was dying up there. He goes, I was dying. He goes, hold on, George, hold on. And I kept make, if I could just make it to one minute, I was looking at my clock. And I was like, I, he says, I was about, I had a bailout plan. And I almost bailed out. And then. He heard that first laugh and he goes, hang on, hang on. And he, and he, he told me how tortured he was. Because he was like just that. scared shitless. Scared shitless, man. Wow. He told me all about it. And then he heard, he heard that first laugh right before a minute. He's like, okay, he says, hold, you, hold on, hold on. But he, ha- he was ready to bail out. And he didn't. Wow. And then he didn't have to. And then it went crazy. And then he didn't have to. Go figure, man. That's wild. George Carlin, man. That was one of the most amazing nights of my life. So, uh, well, so then we go down to shoot our scene, right? And uh, they sit me up on this like box and uh, they gave me that guitar and uh, they're going to shoot me from the neck down and George Carlin from the neck up. Okay. And, and, and Keanu and, and these two girls, they're actually on my Twitter now. It's funny. These two girls. It's actually, funny. <laughs> and Ke- Ke- Keanu, Keanu and, uh, and Alex are standing in front of me and the camera's right here. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? And Steven's like, I don't know. Just, move your hands in a crazy okay now i wasn't plugged in there was no amp so i started off the first thing i could think of was eruption so i went and i hit the a chord like eruption then right. almost like like the beginning of eruption if you watch it but i didn't and i just started moving my fingers i wasn't actually really playing i was playing and i knew it was a comedy so i was doing crazy shit i got you know, moving my fingers all over the neck in the most unorthodox way possible uh, because I wanted it to be funny. Right. And I wanted it to look crazy because it's a comedy, right? Right. I wasn't thinking about the guitar. Yeah, yeah. You weren't thinking about notes or anything like that. No. So then I go the next day into the studio now and I put it up on the monitor and I got to score it. 
And I'm like, what did I do? Because I'm like, it's like, and I was just following my fingers. So there's no music, That's, and you have to now put the music on. Yeah. So oh all I God. did, all I did was follow my fingers with, for hell or high water. Whatever they did, I just followed as best I could. What yeah. I, but I was watching. Okay. To me, it sounds like a load of nonsense, and it's hilarious, and it's funny, and it's total bullshit, right? Right, right. All of a sudden, years later, I'm sitting in London, England, I don't know, six or seven years ago, eight years ago, and I'm sitting with Jimmy Dunlap, you know, Jim Dunlap, the wah-wah pedals. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy's, my, Jimmy's like my best friend. He used to bodyguard for me, actually, when he was young. And um, me and Jimmy <sighs> are sitting wild. in a bar in London. You know, we're sitting in a bar in London. We're having a drink in the afternoon. We were on one of our Hemingway trips where we went off deep into the ethers of Europe for a couple of weeks and disappeared <laughs> in the madness. And we're sitting there in the afternoon drinking tequila. And this guy walks up to me with long hair and he goes, you know, you're, you're Stevie Stalls? And I go, yeah. He goes, oh my God, wow. And he says, uh, I just finished my, what do they call it? Like, it's like the end of the year finals. He went to the, whatever the big music academy is in London. And it's not, they're called the finals. It's called, uh, you know, something they do in school and university. I yeah, is, I know what you're talking about. I don't know. They're, they're theses, they're end of the school theses or some shit. And everyone was to study the Stevie Solace, George Carlin guitar solo from Bill and Ted That's and hilarious. do a report on it. Do a report on it. Everyone talked about these different variations I used, the pentatonic, the fucking, you know, mixolydian or whatever the fuck it is, you know, and all this different shit and how I came up with this stuff. And, and it's fascinating how I would go right from this to that and back to this. Like it was really like, and I told the guy, that's all bullshit. I played air guitar. I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I played air guitar and I just followed my fingers. I was playing fucking air guitar when I filmed it. Oh and they're like, he's like, what? He thought it was like, all like mathematically worked out. And, 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 and that's that just bullshit. blew my mind. Yeah. But you know, but then it tells you, you know, sometimes in life, I did an album for a guy called Ronald Shannon Jackson once with Bill Laswell. He's a, oh, yeah. He, yeah, Vernon Reed used to be his guitar player. And I remember coming to New York and it was like this jazz music that was just like noise. I was like, <laughs> and I didn't get it at all. I thought it was, I don't get this. You can't really tell the difference between that and this. And, you know, I later on would find out you could because I remember Richie Kotzen, who was my neighbor and one of my best friends for 20 years in LA. Richie, one day, I uh, come in his house and he goes, listen, listen, I'm listening to Giant Steps. And he goes, listen. And, and, you know, in giant steps, the horn goes. That's what it sounds like to me. Richie's going, listen. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, one, two. Hear that? You hear that? And I, 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 all I hear is. That's all I hear. And Richie could count it out. And then Richie figured out the notes on the guitar. Holy crap. Richie's like this. Richie's like a savant, like a genius, you know, <laughs> you know, guy. He's all shy, but he's like. You know, he's one of my best friends and he, you know, he, he's different around me than everybody else. Everyone else will sit in a room and won't talk. And around me, he's like, he's just awesome human being. And, uh, so I knew that there was a method to this Ronald Shannon Jackson shit that I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it. So like during one time I got lost and Jason Cassaro was recording us. And I remember I took my guitar pissed off cause I was lost and grabbed the guitar and I was hitting it against the SSL, the strings going, <clears throat> like smashing it against this board and the strings are going bleh, 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 because it's running through some marshals all loud and i turned around and ronald and and uh, bill laswell and i i believe uh, um i don't know if that was the night but that uh, also um uh, miles davis because miles davis came and hung out one night all night while i was doing color code and this was while i was doing the first color code album. that's cool yeah and uh i looked and they were all like this they were just like oh they were so <laughs> it, they were grooving they were so, on it. They were so into this thing. And I was just going, ah, ah, like, fucking fucker. I fucking lost. You know? And then I grabbed the guitar and put it back on. It just kept playing. Okay, Holy so I think I, I finished the thing. I get to go meet Herbie Hancock, all this cool shit. Uh, they, they, they're they all happy. And I'm thinking in my mind, this is all bullshit. Fucking jazz is bullshit. So then the album review comes out in Billboard. And it says, Stevie Solace's finest work he's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm starting to think, wait a second. <laughs> Maybe it's not bullshit. Maybe I'm too stupid to get it. Maybe there's something I'm doing subconsciously that's going on that I don't even understand. And it made me thought and humble myself a bit and think, I better fucking just shut up and try to figure out because these are smart people. 
Bill yeah. Laswell's no joke. You know what I mean? That, he's no joke. Ronald Sam Jackson was no joke. And maybe I'm just too stupid to understand it, and I should just shut my mouth. And there you go. And that's what I did. So with Bill and Ted, maybe what I did subconsciously was something that was on another level that I just don't understand. And yeah. it came through. It, I was channeling it through something because all I was doing was playing air guitar and trying to be funny. And it moved people in such a way that to this day, when I die, they're not going to say he's the guy who played with Mick Jagger. They're going to say he's the guy who did Bill and Ted. Well, it's interesting. You know, I had a conversation recently with, um, I think somebody in LA with probably, uh, um, brain fart, uh, Mark Bonilla. Do you know Mark? Yeah, Mark. I know Mark really well. Yeah. Yeah. Mark and I were in a, we were in a, we were in a poster together for Yamaha once. For Yamaha. Yeah. Cause that's right. He still plays Yamaha. And, um, I think it was him. He said music, it was him. He said, music doesn't come from you. It flows through you. He's right. He's right. And, and it was interesting because he said, if you look at it, that it comes from you and it's really bad because then it's a finite source because you, you only right. have so much. But if you look at it, it flows through you and there's something in the universe, whatever spirit, that, you know. It's the Jedi. It's yeah, the man. Jedi. That's the, right. It's the force. Yeah. When they talk about that, when I was a music director for American Idol, I used to tell the young kids, Remember the scene in Star Wars when, when Obi-Wan gives him the, the lightsaber and, and he puts the blindfold on him and says, your eyes will trick you. And he started going like that, wham, wham. And he started getting it because he wasn't thinking. The minute you're playing guitar or any instrument, I think, and I start thinking about what's coming next, I am no longer here. I am here. And I'm a split second off now. When I just play it and it happens, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. As soon as I think about it, no good and he's right about that yeah. if you don't think and you just let it come and you do it a lot of times that's when you listen back later and go fuck i did that that's fucking yeah. pretty good i thought it i thought it sucked yeah. let me ask you this stevie um a couple of things you produced rumble that movie we talked about about the uh, yeah. influence of native americans and rock and roll uh what prompted you to make it and what did you learn from your experience in making it well there's a lot of reasons that i wanted to make the film i originally used to have a hobby of being wondering i, I remember i was playing madison square gardens and i and i thought to myself i can't be the only native american guitar player who's ever played madison square gardens can i right so i started to do a little research i'm like fine of course not you know, Jesse Ed Davis, George Harrison, and you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Robbie Robertson, there's all. That. So I started to, as a hobby, just to start looking at who are these other Native American musicians, uh, just as a hobby, because Randy Castillo, who played with Ozzy and I, hung out a lot, and we used to talk a lot about this stuff, because Randy Randy Castillo was like a big brother to me as well, and really helped me a lot in my life, and um, he was a Native American, and so um, it was just a hobby, and then around 2000. Maybe it's 2002 or 2001, I don't know, in the ballpark. I was flying up to Canada, to Toronto, to, to open up for the Rolling Stones at this gig. Um, and I'd already done Jagger, and I'd already been around the Stones a lot since 95, so I knew them. And, and, um, but while there, I got a phone call from a guy called Brian Wright McLeod, who's a, who's a book writer. And he was doing this thing called the Encyclopedia of Recorded History of Native American Music, going all the way back to 1904. Hmm. And he wanted to interview me for the, for the book. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I met with him and, I, and then he sat me down and he, re, don't, you know, he turned me on to so much about Link Ray and so much about Jesse Ed and, and uh, all these things I didn't know about. And I started to think that being a Native American person, I'd realized that a lot of times they don't realize Native American people have a lot of role models out there. They just don't know about them. So instead of like, you know, their role model is Biggie Smalls. I mean, they can have somebody else. They, they have their own native person they can be into. It. Yeah. Or their role models not, are, are, are here today. They're not all from, you know, they're not all from 150 years ago. And I wanted them to know that. So I started to think maybe I could make a book, a coffee table book about these guys or do something. Because I had, you know, I, have, I, have, I had a, a platform that I could pull off things like that now yeah. at, the, at this point in my life. And um, I worked, I met, I met, introduced, um, Brian to some filmmakers in Canada. They tried to get a film done. They couldn't get it done. Um, and then one day I'm giving a speech at the Six Nations Indian Reservation for the opening of a studio called Jukasa Studio, this beautiful studio. 
uh, on the Six Where Nations Reserve. Where is it's that? On, it's on the Six Nations Indian Reservation, Jukasa, J-U-K-A-S-A. And I found the SSL board for the studio. It was the Abbey Road Studio 3 board. And I helped uh, the Native American owner, Kenny Hill, uh, get that because I was producing a band in Costa Rica and I found the board down there and it was for sale. So I went up to give a speech at his opening. I flew in for it. And while I gave the speech about Native American people, I said, uh, you know, everybody's always trying to get one Native into the mainstream. You make them so proud. And I go, that's the wrong approach. I go, we got to bring the mainstream to Indian country because people want to love us. They want to know about us. And he liked what I had to say, a guy called Tim Johnson that was in the crowd, who was the uh, co-head of the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. And he said, you, would you come down and see the museum and, you know, and talk to me about some of this stuff? I like what you had to say. So I flew to Washington, D.C., and um, we saw the museum. And he goes, let's go see the New York Museum. So we both just went to the train station, jumped on a train to go to New York to Manhattan to see that museum. And on the train ride, I told him this story about these musicians that I'd been trying to get a film made and wanted to do this. And, and he really, Tim Johnson really got it. He said, we need to do an exhibit on this. So I took a job at the Smithsonian and we went to work on creating an exhibit. It was called Upper We Belong Natives in Popular Culture. And this is in and Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. and then went on to, to be in New York. Uh, it was when supposed said, to be a... I'm ahead. sorry. When you said Jucasa, where physically, where is that location? Is that in California? Or? It's on Six Nations Indian Reservation. So if you put Six Nations Canada... Oh, okay. Can Studios, Canada. 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 Okay, yeah. Canada. Okay, thank you. So... On that train ride, he, he, he flipped out about this story. He said, let's create a, an exhibit on it. Um, I took a job at the Smithsonian, and it was only supposed to be a tiny exhibit that was supposed to run for three months, and it was supposed to just be an exhibit of merit to show Native people that they had these incredible people that, against all odds, had accomplished amazing things, influencing music as we know it. But what happened was we started to create the exhibit and I was flying all over and I was calling all my rock star friends because I knew that I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't have a bunch of native American musicians talking about these people. I needed, if I was going to say these people influenced the greatest musicians in the world, I needed the greatest musicians in the world to say it. Man, that is you know? really very smart. What, that's yeah, that's really, well, it's a must. And luckily I was maybe acceptance. the only person. I, may, I might have been one of the only people on the planet who could have pulled that off because I had, you know, I can call Steven Tyler. I can call yeah. those people. You know? um, so I knew that it was a responsibility that I had to really take upon myself to do if I wanted it to really be the message to work. Um, and what happened was the more that we interviewed these people, the more that we realized that these people worshipped. I mean, Jesse Ed Davis played with all four Beatles. Yeah. He played with Rod Stewart before I did. I was even playing Jesse Ed Davis guitar parts when I was playing Rod Stewart at Mas Madison Square Gardens when I wasn't even knowing that there was an ever Native American who had ever played Madison Square Gardens. Just how crazy is that? Yeah. So, you know, these guys were worshipped. Clapton wrote me like Jesse Ed Davis was, a, was, was like way ahead of his time. And, you know, Ringo Starr wrote me. Jesse was amazing. You know, all these people, I'm thinking Native American people often feel like people look down at them. And I wanted them to see that the, these most amazing historic musicians worshiped them, worshiped them. And so we did the exhibit, the exhibit exploded, became the most popular exhibit they ever had. Um, went to New York, made it four times bigger, it ran for a year there. Uh, and then I decided we really need to make a film. So I went upon myself to start meeting uh, production companies. And, and um, I met the girls that did a film called Real Engine, Resolution Pictures in Montreal. They flipped out. We went to a thing called Hot Docs. I sat in front of every network and I pitched it. Every network said yes, which is unheard of. Uh, and then we had to figure out the whole thing. We decided on HBO and Canada and PBS. We wanted it to be a credible film. We weren't thinking about uh, trying to make a ton of money. We we're thinking about real credibility and history. We wanted a history film. And uh, we did this film and it was really hard to make. It took five years to make. It came out and it won Sundance and then the whole world went crazy. And there you go. And it's a great movie. It was really nice watching it. I'm glad you, when we first spoke, I'm glad you mentioned it because it was really cool. No, thank you. I, I want to talk about, we spoke earlier, but I want your commentary on this. I wrote down a comment when I saw the movie. It was extremely intense. Uh, Robbie Robertson at the end, about a minute and a half from the end as the song credits roll out, he says, be proud you're an Indian. His mom told him, I think, be proud you're an Indian. Be careful who you tell. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. intense, man. Yeah, it's true. It was true. You know what? You, well, you know, I asked Robbie one time. I said, Robbie, I go, 
when you walked in and you were young and you would go to an audition, would they know you were a Mohawk Indian? He goes, no. He goes, you didn't walk into an audition and say, hey, I'm Bob Polanski, I'm Polish. You just, <laughs> you just didn't do it. It didn't matter. It was all about, can you play? Yeah. What do you yeah. got? And it just never came up. And, right. and, and I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was brilliant. And uh, I understood it completely. I told you, I think Matt Sorum said on a television show one time I saw that in, he was talking about Hollywood and early days of making it and stereotypes. And he, and he said that guys like Slash and Stevie Solace, um, they had to work maybe a little bit harder because they didn't fit the stereotype. Vernon Reed too, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. um, you know, because uh, we didn't fit the stereotype of what a rock and roll guitar player is supposed to be like in the, the whole image of rock and roll, right? So. Interesting, man. All right, let's switch over. Oh, no, one question. What um, low points, man, what were some of the low points or the darker periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? You mentioned obviously being homeless. That was probably not a high point. That summer of 85 was hard, uh, but the real hard time was 1991. Um, everything I did... Like I said, uh, Bill and Ted, huge. Was Not Was, huge. Rod Stewart, huge. Everything I was doing was just, was just, I could do no wrong. Color Code comes out. It's reviewed globally like a masterpiece, but it didn't sell. It didn't sell well. I, um, I was in the middle of a deal. I was distributed by Warner Brothers. Polygram had bought Island Records, but couldn't take over the record for six months. So Warner Brothers is like, why should we push any right. of this shit because we're, lo we're losing it in six months so here i am playing a sold out tour with satriani and there's no records in the stores and and i took a beating and what had happened was i i was used to being celebrated in new york city and, and in and in la it's like this whiz kid special guy and now color code bombed and people would be like hey man i heard your album was great but i heard it bombed you know I'm like oh yeah great thanks and, uh, or, you know, all of a sudden was, maybe I wasn't getting invited to all the same VIP parties that someone would make sure I was on the guest list for, because sure. my record was, my record was cold and, uh, I got my feelings really, I, it really damaged me because I got so used to this, the adulation of how great I was, right? Fucking bullshit. And I really was, it was kicking my ass. I felt embarrassed. You know, I didn't have a hit record. I felt like, you know, it was, it was such high expectations. And it was really hard to deal with. And one day I get a call from Bootsy Collins, big brother Bootsy, thank God, Bootsy Collins. And he goes, uh, Stevie. He goes, uh, <laughs> Dude, you have his voice like oh, down, I, I got him down. Trust me, so I got him down. Fucking I right. time. He goes, uh, you know, he goes, what you did is you tricked yourself into getting your feelings hurt. And I'm like, what? And he goes, you tricked yourself into getting your feelings hurt because those people weren't really ever your friends to begin with. There you go, man. So therefore, if they weren't your friends, then your feelings wouldn't be hurt, right? And I'm like, oh. thank you, Bootsy. And it was like, it put me back in the gear, got me back in that the game. That quick. That quick, man. Yeah, it made all the great. sense in the world. These people weren't my friends. It was like people I knew, you know, like they liked me because I was a shiny light. Yeah, man. Yeah. You're the next shiny object and that, that, yeah. that's glowing. Um, yeah, and I learned a lot from that, and I never fell for that trick again. Never. Well, that's what I was going to ask you next. What is the most important thing you learned out of that? You know, it goes back to Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart said during that, around that, maybe it was earlier than that, though, he'd give me a lesson. He said to me, Stevie, he goes, life is full of mountains and valleys. He goes, he goes, he goes like this, he goes, so you get hot and you're going up that hill and you're working hard and you're going up and you reach the top and you're the king. Just what you can't stay up there. You can't stay. It's impossible. So pretty soon you got to come down. But when you're coming down, it's tough. He goes, but you got to keep on going because don't give up. Don't quit. Cause when you're at the bottom, you don't quit. You got to keep moving. And if you keep moving sooner or later, you'll start going back up that hill. If you keep moving, but if you stop, you'll stay there. You got to keep moving mountains and valleys. Rod Stewart, man. I was like, Thank you, Rod. That's it's, cool. Uh, man. Yeah, and it's like that. You know, I think of bands like Cheap Trick. You know, I often would feel like I remember in the late '90s, uh, I was selling an astronomical amount of records in Japan. Uh, uh, I couldn't walk down the street without getting my hair pulled out of my head. And after about eight years, it finally slowed down, and I thought to myself, "Okay, it's over. My career is over." I just thought like it's over for me. Um, I can't. You know, I don't get the budgets I make in it getting anymore after 1999. I'm not going to have the. And I go, it's over. I had my run. I had a good run. What am I going to do with my life now? 
And then I think about Cheap Trick. You know, Cheap Trick was huge, the biggest band in the world in the in the eighties, late seventies, eighties, mm -hmm. or whatever it was. And then then they went through. They were playing bars. Yeah. Bars forever obscure. I kept going. Rick kept going, and Robin kept going. The next thing you know, they get Richie Zito does the Flame. They're number one again, and they're huge again. And you think like. How many times would they have thought, like, let's break up the band now. We're over. We had a great run. We were playing yeah. football stadiums. Now we're playing fucking Hank's Bar and Grill. They never quit. Yeah. They just kept going. And that's a real lesson for everybody out there because it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy business. You just got to keep pounding, man. Man, life is not easy in general. I don't think you can. Now it's really tough. Going. Yeah, for everything. It's tough for young, for young musicians now. It's so, so tough. I feel so bad for them. You know, because at least when I was a kid, you know, you had a record company that said, like, Steve, you're doing something interesting here. Take this 20,000 bucks and go work with this guy. Call this guy and then come back and see me in a month. You know, it was like you had people that supported you and developed you back then. Record right. companies used to. Yeah, it's totally different. I mean, let's talk about uh, gear for a few minutes. Um, guitars. What's your go to that you're like playing now? And has that changed over the years? And what other two or three round out your top list? Yeah, they, they change a lot. But right now, for the last bunch of years, I've been designing. I've I went, out, I went to Germany and redesigned the whole Framus line with oh, Marcus cool. Spangler. And I have my, my Framus Signature Idol Maker, it's called. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's, people love it. It won guitar, the NAM uh, guitar, the, it won the show, NAM show guitar of the, the show. Uh, it was voted the best guitar, like coolest new guitar, best design. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing guitar. It's a, by Framus, and I designed it. I brought Phil X with me over to Framus, and he designs, him and I designed some guitars with Marcus. And, uh, the new Framus stuff is insane. It's really expensive right now, but it's going to get cheaper. Very cool. um, I, and then before that, I had all weird guitars. I told myself in 2000, I was no longer going to play a guitar on stage that looked like a Les Paul or a Strat. Really? So I had, you know, yeah, I have all weird guitars. I got like a Capari saw so made me these weird guitars. If you look, look, Google me, you'll see pictures of me with weird guitars. Or watch Mick Jagger, everybody getting high, the live video. I'm playing a square guitar. You know, I play all <laughs> kinds of weird stuff, you know. Um, but most of my guitars are based on the original Hamer that Joel Danzig made for me in 1987, 88, he made me a, a telly shaped Hamer. It was a, mahogany, a mahogany body with a maple cap and a maple neck. And he put in these Bill Lawrence pickups and, uh, and that has been my main sound. When I went to Yamaha, I'd use that guitar's design. I use that guitar as the main design function of what I do. Cause I can play uh, in the rhythm pickups and it's funky and, and I can play it on the back and it rocks. Very cool, man. Uh, what's the best guitar and best amp you've ever owned or played through? Well, I have a gazillion of them. I have one of Robin Trower's Marshall 810s that sounds insane, but it only sounds insane with my 50-watt Plexi from 1968. Uh, you know, oh, I, got wow. a, I, got my, I got a 69 Super Lead that I used on Color Code that I've used on a million hours. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, a, guy in, a guy in Italy right now uh, named Carlo Serrazio, he has a company called LAA Custom. And he makes a lot of shit for me and Phil X and a lot of guys in Europe. And he made my Nishi Drive overdrive pedal, which is amazing. It's amazing. And he made, uh, he makes me these valve amps that sound like the best Marshall you ever owned at its finest moment. <laughs> and, 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 and it's, it's, they're insane. And I use a lot of those. I love those. Cause it's, it's called like LAA insane. custom. Yeah. But my favorite amp that I've ever owned that I've done most of my albums with, and most other people's albums with is a blackface 1965 fender deluxe reverb and i've used it on a million records dude everybody just loves an old fender like 90 yeah. percent of the people i've interviewed yeah. yeah yeah it's the best for recording when i blend that fender like the whole first color code album is a 68 marshall a 69 marshall super lead through two book a boogie cabinet with the evs in it and the uh, other one was a one of my uh my uh york yorkville sound cabinets with uh celestian 30 watts in it and then I ran, um, and I put them together, put that together with my Fender Deluxe running through a, um, a Marshall with Greenbacks. And that was the whole sound of color code. It was a blend of those microphones constantly moving around. And with the Hamer? With I, used Hamer. A lot of ha I used a lot of Hamers on it. And then I have a Stratocaster that's my coolest guitar I've ever had. I, I built it in high school in Carlsbad at, at Resistance Exchange where I used to work. And uh, it's just a bunch of parts with some old 70s Bill Lawrence single blade pickups in it and some Mighty Might parts, and it's the best sounding guitar I've ever owned, and it, it's on a bazillion records. You're a big fan of the Bill Lawrence pickups, obviously. There's some, nothing like them. I love, I love Seymour's too, and Seymour's a friend of mine, and, and they used to make me, they make a, most of my pickups are made by Seymour, because it's hard to find those Bill Lawrence's. But we once took apart one of those Bill Lawrence OBLs and, at Seymour Duncan, and we were like, we don't know what the hell's going on here, we can't figure it out. 
we came close to it, but there's something that Bill was doing back then on the OBLs and on those single blades that I don't know what it is. They're just amazing. Yeah, I've heard, I've had a few guys on the show that like them and they're, they're like in their DNA, you know, they're that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're a must. Man, uh, top Desert Island Discs, top three, just for now, man. Uh, James Brown, uh, Star Power with the, you know, all James Brown's like a James Brown, the greatest hits from back in the day. Um, David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. Great record, man. And, uh. Maybe kiss a live one. I don't know. <laughs> That's a big one, man. That's a big one. Yeah. All right. Tough questions now. Um, this is a tough one. What do you like most about yourself, Stevie? Um, the ability to work hard. The, the ability to, to get 20 things done at once. Um, Where that, where's that come from? My, my father was a hard worker. Right. Uh, but I love the work. Uh, I really love the work. I love, I mean, I just love getting things done. Uh, and I love, I don't necessarily work for success, but I find that if you do the work, the success comes. I tell people all the time, I tell musicians mostly, just now that I'm older and I, like I said, especially when I was doing American Idol, I was you know, interviewing and auditioning hundreds of musicians for this thing and stuff. I would, I would say like, don't do anything for money. Do it because you love it and you can't not do it and do it the best you can. And, and if you're lucky, the money will come. Right, right. right. But, but you'll go to bed every night feeling good about yourself if it doesn't because you know that you didn't sell out and you didn't do something stupid and shitty. And I think that's why I've had a long career. I never took the shitty gig for money. I never took that gig. Um, you know, I'll tell you a story and I don't know if Richie would appreciate it or not, but Richie Kotzen's, you know, one of the most amazing singer and guitar players and one of my dearest, closest friends. And when he was young, he took that gig in Poison when CC quit right. or they fired CC. And at the time, you know, it was a lot of money and they were a big band, but then music changed overnight because of grunge. Right. Richie got Kotzen, still the most fantastic guitar player. Years later, years later, he gets a call. I think it was from Trent Reznor. I think it was Trent Reznor to go audition for Nine Inch Nails. I think it was Trent. It was either Trent or Marilyn Manson, but I think it was Trent. And uh, he comes and he plays. And Trent Reznor goes, fuck, you're amazing. He goes, I had no idea. You know, I just saw you because Twiggy or somebody said that I should see you. But, and I wasn't expecting much. He goes, you're incredible. Which he is. And he thought, and so then he said to Richie, I really want to hire you. I want to give you this gig. He goes, I don't know how I'll deal with it. The first time that an interviewer walks up to and interviews me and says, so what made you hire the guy from Poison? That was a harsh reality yeah. of a choice. Now, I love the guys, you know, Ricky and Poison, and those guys are nice guys. They're my buddies. But this is reality of business. This isn't personal. Yeah. And so that choice, you stuck with Richie. And Richie, quite honestly, could have been the guitar player for Nine Inch Nails and all these other things, which you would, you know. And Ozzy, Ozzy wanted him too, but it was the same kind of thing. So the choices you make make a big difference in your life. And, uh, and oh. there's nothing wrong with Poison because those guys yeah, are my yeah, friends no, and I love I totally them. But it was a time with the way, the way music had went with grunge and then with, the, with that whole Nine Inch Nails, Manson kind of dark thing. It was, a, it was an issue. And, you know, people quite honestly tell me in magazines, I'll read it. Like, he was a genius. He made all the right choices. Was not was. Bill and Ted. And that's fucking bullshit too because I'm going to tell you right now, I needed to get a job nobody was talking about bill and ted it didn't even have it it lost its distributor and we didn't even know if it was ever going to come out and then it becomes this phenomenon wow. it becomes this piece of pop culture yes. now it looks like i'm a genius we never even thought the film was going to come out okay was not was ain't nobody was trying to fucking knock down the door to play on a was not was record okay? right nobody right. was saying this is like i gotta be on this record you know what i mean yeah, and then it becomes number one it becomes hip rolling stone names the top album of the decade top 100 albums of the decade i got my name as a producer then it was like cool but it wasn't at the time something people were trying to do um a lot of those things that i did they were i did them because they were cool musicians and the stuff was cool and i needed to make i needed a job right uh, now look now it looks like i picked only the cool shit so it was, it's, it's random that some of this stuff went uh, up the way it did totally random yeah. i'm telling you bill and ted came out a year after we finished because it lost this distributor. We never even thought it was going to come out. 
Wow. So, so let alone make a billion dollars or whatever it did. Right. You know? Uh, so you just never know, but you can, you can think about it. Like I never took a gig, you know, playing on the love boat or I never took a gig playing in Vegas on it. And maybe I, I could use, Hey, you're going to pay me a thousand. It'll be fun. I'll go play ladies night every night. for five. I never did that stuff. Right. I would rather be broke and wait. And, um, that was just my way. Are you good with, cause I know, when you tend to be like when you, you said, uh, I like to work because it feels good when you get shit done. Yeah. I totally yeah. get that. Are yeah. you good with like taking breaks and say, Hey man, it's playtime now. I do that a lot. I mean, if yeah. you ever watch me on Facebook, I'm all over the planet and I do a lot of, a lot of balance. I got a lot of balance in that. I have a lot of fun. I have you a lot always, of fun. You always been like that balance or is only since you got a little older or. Well, maybe I didn't have so much balance when I was younger because I was obsessed with everything, right? I was obsessed with music. I could write in songs, you know. I'd write so many songs and I would sit home at night and just write and write and write and go in a studio every night and work. And I had a publishing deal with Polygram and I, I, was, I was obsessed. You know, I, I was obsessed, but I also still had a lot of fun. I had okay. a lot of, I've had, I'd have had a pretty fun life. Okay, so you've been good about balance. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, something or someone you miss from your childhood? Oh, you know, the obvious would be, I miss my father a great deal. I miss, uh, when did your dad pass a long time ago? He passed, he passed when I was writing my book actually, which made it really oh, hard to, wow. hard to yeah. do. Sorry, man. Um, who, who is, who am I thinking of that has passed? There's people that have died that I really, really admired. Um, trying to think musically that would make sense to your audience. Um, but you know, I, there's a lot of people that were inspiring to me that were helpful to me that I had great knowledge that, that, um, that got helped me to be where I am now. And, you know, a lot of people say, where the hell are you now? I don't even know who you are. But if you look at my credits and you look at what I've done, I'm pretty, con I'm pretty content with it. I think at the time I would have liked to, there was a time when I would have liked to have been the biggest star in the world. But at a time I was the biggest star in Japan. I found that I didn't like it that much. I, I, I would chew food and I'd watch people watching me chew my food. Everything was uncomfortable. I remember I go to Hollywood, I go to Chinchin, I hear people whispering my name and, and I feel uncomfortable. And I kind of like where I'm at now where, you know, Steven Tyler calls me and, hey, you want to jam? And I'm like, yeah, but I don't have to walk down the street and have everybody bother me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's That's like, uh, cool. I would, yeah, I'm like, I was on an airplane a couple of days ago coming home from uh, Seattle and, and I was sitting in first class and a guy walks by and he goes, Stevie. And he goes, are you, well, did you play in Seattle? What are you doing up here? And I looked at him and I was like, oh, you know, so, no, I didn't play. I was up here hiking with my son, you know, it's like, you know, so it happens where people recognize me still, but I'm content with where I am. Cool, man. Uh, most important thing your dad taught you. My dad taught me how to be a hard worker, yeah. how to, how to take pride in his work. And you know, the whole thing was, if you're going to do something, do it right. Be great at it. Don't just do it. Be shitty at it. That's a waste of time. It's the same things I tell my son. Yeah. And how about your mom? Most important thing she taught you? I don't know what my mom taught me. You know, yeah, my you mom. See, you and, butt heads with her, you seem like? Yeah, you know, me and my mom are funny. But my mom married a, a musician named John Reeder when I was really young and uh, like three years, old, three years old. He was a rock musician. And at, growing up with him and learning about music, he, you know, he'd sit in their house and we'd listen to Led Zeppelin and Hendrix all day. That's how I knew about Cream. That's how I knew who Clapton was when I was like four years old. And that was amazing to me because it really is a foundation for me. Uh, and I'm thankful of that time with him and my mother um, because watching him play in his band, I, I, so maybe I didn't start playing guitar until I was 15, but through osmosis, I think I, I, I understood it. I could pick it up quickly right. uh, because of that. And having that balance of him and then my father being a little bit more stern and uh, in his way and having the looseness of my- Your audio break, lost your audio. Oh, you did? Oh no, it's back. It's right back. Right back. No, it's back. It was really weird. Oh, is it there now? No, I find now. It was just really weird. It was just you were talking all of a sudden. No, so, go ahead, man. Sorry. You were saying having the balance with him and then the sternness of your dad. The balance of him and a rock and roll lifestyle, and then the sternness of my father, was a really good uh, balance for me. You know. Very cool. Well, I think you, I think parenting I think parenting is one of the most important things uh, anybody can do to help someone be successful at anything. Oh God! You know yeah, I mean? are you kidding me? <laughs> oh man, what what would you say your biggest business and biggest personal wins would be? My biggest business win 
was in 1994, I did Color Code Back from the Living, which exploded for me all over the place. A song called Tell Your Story, Walk In and Start Again. And then I was on the radio in America and I was on the radio in Europe and I was on the, in Japan. It was the biggest album ever. It's like the hugest album. And that's when my life went from, I could sell 10,000 tickets in a week in Tokyo and make a couple hundred thousand dollars and come home. And I was, I became loaded. And then from that, I got into a bidding war because that was my last Polygram album. And I got into a bidding war that, that, and I made, and it made me a millionaire. You know, oh, I, got these, I got these deals where I got the cash all up front. I had my own label. They, I, they gave me the money up front, you know, and it was a half a million dollar budget per album. And again, and they let me have money to sign other bands. And I, it was, it was financially the greatest moment of my life. Uh, but the problem was I didn't know anything about investing money. I didn't know anything. me and Jimmy Dunlap guys like that were buying stocks. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. I lost a million bucks in the stock market. Wow. So that was the biggest, that was my biggest disappointment in my life. Sure. You know, man. As far as financially. Um, but that was my biggest moment when I had a bidding war going and I made all that money. It was, it was amazing. The life became really awesome for me. I could just think about writing songs and working and doing the jobs I wanted to do and right. not taking jobs. You know, it was really, really a great feeling. Owned a few houses, you know, things like that. Um, but the greatest moment, there was a couple of great moments. Great, greatest moment for me, meeting George Clinton, obviously. Meeting Rod Stewart and getting on that tour yeah. um, was amazing. Meeting Morty Wiggins and signing with Bill Graham was an amazing moment for me. Um, um, in 2000, my girlfriend died. And I went into a deep, deep oh, hole. Man. Dude, yeah, and so I didn't, sorry. I didn't want to, I didn't want to play. I didn't want to do anything. I was just really like, I was dying inside. And out of the blue, my phone rings, and it's Mick Jagger. And and it was like, if I ever needed a boost in my life, at that wow. moment, to, to get a call from the biggest rock star in the world, to come play with him, was like it was like a gift from God. It was like it came out of nowhere, and it was like, oh my God. It's like I needed this right now, like I never needed anything in my life, and it got me kind of up and out and thinking again, and and uh, it got me on the path to to uh, to uh, healing, because Mick reminded me how you know Mick, you talk about hard work, you know Mick Jagger at rehearsal, you know how he runs around on stage every night, yeah. and does all the dance, he does that during rehearsal on every song. I mean, we could be sitting down just practicing a chorus, and he goes, okay, let's try the chorus again, and he and he just goes. And he's dancing and the whole rehearsal. I mean, that guy was so inspiring. You know, he made rehearsal feel like well, you better fucking come either a game to rehearsal because fucking yeah. Jag's looking you in the eye and he's fucking rocking and he's going like it's, he's going like it's, you know, the Dodger stadium just right there at SIR. So <laughs> it, it's re-inspired me again to remind me what was important about being great and striving for greatness. Because yeah. Mick Jagger certainly doesn't have to do that anymore. And he did it every day. And it really was important for me to see that and remind myself that you can't phone it in. You got to fucking do it. Wow. That's heavy, man. Sorry about your loss. Was that like sudden or like something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. man. That's terrible, man. Do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music, Stevie? Yeah. You like yeah. fishing. I, yeah. My son and I were just fishing off Mexico last week and, and, uh, I love surfing and I love, uh, traveling the world and surfing and i love um I, lo I love having fun man i just have an amazing time on there. what's your favorite place you travel you've been all over i've been all over i love every a lot of places i mean costa rica i own a bunch of land in costa rica i love it there i love um catalina island off the coast of los angeles i've been going there since i was a kid i love it and my son loves it um i love um paris france i love uh sydney i love sydney australia there's a lot of places i really really dig do you like Japan? Because I know you spend a lot of time there. People always ask me, is Japan my favorite place? And they assume that it is because I was always so famous there. Right. You know, but that, I, it's not my famous, favorite place. I ask myself, would I go there on my own all the time if I wasn't famous there or making a ton of money there? I don't think I would. I love the Japanese people and I love sure. Japan, but it's not like a place I would, I'm going surfing at Chiba Beach for a week in Japan. No, you know, I'm going to go to, Indonesia, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? I'm going to go yeah. to Maldives or I'm going to go to the Seychelles or something. Um, so I love the Japanese people and I love the culture and I love, they've been so good to me. They, they've really made my life amazing, Jap Japan and the fans in Japan. 
you know, watch a video called Fuji Rock 99. And that was when I was retiring from rock and roll. 1990 was going to be my last ever thing. And I play Fuji Rock. And I did this thing where I refused to talk to the crowd. And I was using the force. And I'm <laughs> looking at them. And watch. Watch a video. Like, there's one. There's two. There's one that has a – watch the one uh, – there's two of them. Watch the second one, I think it is, where I stop in the crowd. And I just stand and look at them. And they start going crazy. And I just look at them. And they go crazy. And I go back into the song. And I stop again. I never say, hey, how you feeling? Let me hear you. Any of that. I just stop. And I just look at them and they start going berserk. And I feel it was my most powerful moment in my life when I really could, I was using my something that, over this 35,000, 40,000 people. And um, that's Japan for me. Did you learn that from uh, George Carlin? No, but I tried the same <laughs> kind of thing, man. <laughs> same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, three more questions, man. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Anything you wish you'd done differently or anything you regret not doing? Uh, in real life, I wish that I would have understood what was going on with my girlfriend who passed away more. I just didn't. I wasn't grown up enough to really see the seriousness of it. Uh, as far as music, I wish that I would have known how to invest my money better. Because you know how hard it is to save a million dollars playing guitar? It's not easy. <laughs> and I, I let the, the, the stock market just take it from me. I never even got to enjoy it. You know? So now I do things like I'll go buy Rolexes and I'll buy things you shouldn't buy. Because at least if I'm spending the money, I get to enjoy it. And sure. you know, the stock market, I just... You, you work so hard for it, and then you just give it to somebody and hope it doesn't go away. Yeah. And I guess that's what you're supposed to do, but fuck that. It's like, I, I'm not doing that. I buy houses, and I do other stuff instead yeah. now. And, At least you can get an income off a house, man. And real yeah, estate I, generally goes up in value. I just wish that I would have known what I was doing, because that million books now would probably be five or six million, which would make sure. my life a, a bit easier than it is. My, but my life's not hard now. Totally get it. T toughest decision you've had to make. To quit Rod Stewart. We were going, this is still the toughest decision I had to do. I was signed to Island. It was uh, January 20, January 19, 1989, um, Island Records. We were getting ready to go on a stadium tour of South America. I always wanted to go to South America. It was a dream. And I thought, where am I ever going to see Caracas? You know, with, like I'm going to see it with Rod Stewart playing yeah. the stadium and staying, staying in the best hotel in the world, and, you know, Sao Paulo. And, and it was all stadiums. And Island Records said to me, are you going to be his guitar player? Are you going to be your own artist? And I knew they were right. They were like, get your shit together and start writing and try getting your record recorded. Or go be somebody's guitar player. And it was the hardest thing. I, I wanted so bad just to do that South American leg so bad. And, I, and realistically, hindsight, now I look back, I, I think, like, I should have just did that and then quit after that. Right. Um, but who knows then if I would have made Color Code. And Color Code is one of these records that's been with me my whole life that people just worship. I mean, people use my song just like that at their weddings and shit like that. It's like, who knows if I would have made that same record? I would have made it, but it would have been a different record. Sure. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, totally. So yeah, you can't. Everything happens the way it happens. And, but I really wanted to do that South American tour. Was Rod good? Rod understood when you had that conversation with him? Fucking pissed off, man. Oh, yeah. yeah he was. Yeah. Yeah. You fucker. He goes, I gave you fucking everything and put you in. Now you're, you're quitting me right now. You fucker. Yeah. He was pissed off. Yeah, he I wasn't happy. Who, who uh, wound up taking over the guitar slot? Well, for South America, Jeff Golub quit too because he wanted more money. And uh, they brought in the guy from Mr. Mr. Steve... Uh, Steve, uh, I'm blanking on his name. He's an awesome guy. He's a sweetheart. And they got a guy, and then they brought in another guy called Todd Sharp. It was more of like a country. Todd guy. Sharp, the amp builder? Yeah. It must have maybe been. He the, may, maybe he builds amps now. Todd you know. Sharp amps. Yeah. Got to be the yeah. country guy. He's out of Nashville. Yeah, he's, like a, he's like a country guy. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm not, wow. no disrespect to Todd or Steve, but it sucked. I went to rehearsals. <laughs> Steve wasn't feeling it. You know, Steve was really a, a psychedelic guitar player for Mr. Mr. with all the crazy sounds and the flow. And he had the, you know, the, the Bradshaw rig and all that. And, it, and it wasn't, it wasn't, he was missing that. He was missing Ronnie Wood. And Todd Sharp didn't do Ronnie Wood. Todd, Todd Sharp played clean like a yeah. really tasty clean thing that was it was missing that rock that me and gall have had that and that was the whole premise was, of the whole band apparently yeah. yeah yeah so then what happened was uh, after the south american tour uh, steve left and jeff came back and it was jeff okay. and todd for a long time but it never rocked and never rocked again and just as well because then rod had the downtown train and rod then became much more pop and it became much more of a 
an adult contemporary show. Yeah. And he no longer needed to have that rock and roll, throw your panties on the stage kind of a show anymore, you know? Right. Wow. You know? And Stevie, last question. Biggest change. And man, let me just say, I really appreciate, man. You've been, this has been really cool talking to you, man. I really enjoyed your stories and thanks for oh. sharing so much, man. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of this has been intentional and how much has just been a natural part of aging? I think all of it's been a natural part of, part, part of aging. I, you know, I, when I was younger, like I told you, I'd be like, fuck you. I'm fucking coming in and I don't give a shit what you say. And now I'm still kind of like that, but maybe I say like, you don't, you know, someone says, oh, who are you? Who do you play with? What do you do? And I'm like, fuck off. Google me if you don't fucking know. You know what I mean? It's like, I've earned my fucking stripes. I've fucking paid my dues and I've fucking, and I've, I've pounded that pavement and I've earned it. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't like to, I'm still a bit like, I don't want to walk around and be like the guy with the, with, with the you know, swinging dick fucking, hey man, and, uh, you know, I don't give a shit. It's like, I want to be around nice people that are cool and fun. And, um, but I do enjoy being respected for my, the work that I've done. Um, and I, and, and in turn, I pass out a lot of respect because I'm still a fan. I was a fan when I was a kid and I'm still a fan. When I go play with Billy Gibbons now, I'm still like, look at Billy. <laughs> you know, it's like when I was playing with uh, Jagger, I secretly, I was the music director. So I secretly were trying to figure out what stone songs to play. And I'd be like, I selfishly picked all my favorite stone songs that I used to play in my bedroom. That's hey, can cool. we play live with me? That might be good for the crowd. Knowing damn well, <laughs> knowing damn well it wouldn't be right. But we did oh, that's not a crowd. Nick's like, I got nasty habits. And I'm like, ah! Great you know, song, like, man. So I'm still a fan. When I jam with Steven Tyler, man, and I get to play Walking the Dog or I play Trade Kevin Rowland or something, man. Steven Tyler invited me on stage at a football stadium once with Aerosmith in Central America. He goes up to me, he goes, hey, you, he goes, you want to play Last Child? Okay, Last Child is the ultimate funk rock. Oh song. my God, it's such a and great And I play song. funk rock with my whole fucking foundation. I go, yeah. yeah, I know that one. So, you know, Brad gave me a guitar and I'm on stage with Joe Perry and I'm fucking in a football stadium playing Last Child. I am still, people are more like, oh, Stevie Solace, you know, you, you're so used to playing with these super. I'm still like a little kid when I'm on that fucking stage with those guys. I still look at them and I worship them and admire them and fucking love it. So. Dude. That's awesome. Um, I really appreciate everything. Uh, I hope this, you'll have a long, a lot of people listen to your story here, so it'll go a long way. And I just want to tell anybody, everybody listening to, please check out the movie Rumble. It's a really good movie, really interesting. It's got some deep shit in there. Um, and if you have any interest in uh, music, you like it. It's Rumble, the Indians who rock the world. It is on Amazon. Man, any final words of wisdom? No, nah, man. Just uh, keep up. A- the good work and keep getting guys like eddie martinez and and all those different guys uh out there because they deserve uh people to know who they are because they are they created a foundation uh where the superstars got to shine on a lot of their backs oh totally man well hang on one minute let me wrap up and then you and i'll chat everybody uh thank you so much for listening if you enjoy this please share it on your social media channels we appreciate your support uh check out all stevie salas's music um he's got tons of records uh check out color code that's what he's you know that's still a big platform and he's still if you're in japan you'll be looking forward to seeing him soon uh make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and i can connect and most important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice yeah. play your guitar right and have yeah. fun till next time peace and love everybody i'm out stevie thank you for everything cheers brother you got it